thank you for uh, joining us tonight. It's Thursday, February 7th, and this is the Scarborough School Board meeting. Can I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Mrs. Glidden? Here. Mr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. If you could join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? Um, just to ask uh, Mrs. Sizemore to do attendance, and then there are none. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, is there public comment on tonight's agenda? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm sick, so excuse my delays. <laughs> Come to the podium, um, state your name and your address, and direct your comments towards the chair. Okay. Good evening, Paul Bradbury, 8 Plantation Drive. So, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to speak on the food allergy and the removal of the policy. Thank you for the protocol as we open. Uh, first, I have two children with, uh, with food allergies in the, with the Scarborough uh, School Administrative District, which I can't say enough of how exceptional the Scarborough School District has been for children <laughs> with food allergies. And I believe that is in part to the, and I think they were also very ahead of their time, uh, truly very impressed. My kids uh, have anaphylaxis uh, if exposed to peanut. And, and I think part of that is what the policy had done in the past to really build an awareness of food allergies likely ahead of other school districts in the region. So really pleased with how well Scarborough has done to make food allergies and something that people know about. I grew up, I never knew about a peanut allergy. Suddenly as a parent, I have a child that could die in three minutes due to a peanut allergy. Scarborough has been brilliant. So with that, I just want to say I'm not sure how the protocols fit in with policy, but I certainly see in the protocol and appreciate what was in JLCEA that an educational institution, and I see this is repeated in the protocols, I just don't know how it will be dispensed. Is it the same level of jurisdiction? So as an educational institution, it is a responsibility of the school department to increase awareness of all students, including. So all students, the awareness isn't just with teachers and faculty, it's everyone. And I think it's really important to have that front and center in a policy, because it is amazing, and it is amazing the lack of education on food allergies. So really impressed with Scarborough. I don't want to take a step backwards from our policy guidance that would op introduce a vacuum to the awareness of the community, to our teachers, to all the people that interact in a, in a high school, in a middle school, in an elementary school on a daily basis. So thank you so much for all the great work you've done on food allergies. Please, I'm sure these protocols are wonderful. I haven't been through them. I want the same jurisdictional uh, front and center to keep that awareness going and keep up the great work and don't want to take a step back. And without anything in the packet, I couldn't see where we were going. I just saw removal. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Mm. Hi, my name is Kim Gambardella. I live at 6 Howard Lane. Um, I have three kids in the Scarborough school system, a high schooler, a middle schooler, and a child at Wentworth, and my youngest has food allergies. Um, I'm here to speak in reference to the uh, removal of this two, school, two school food allergy policies on the agenda. I'm sure you know some of the stats. You've seen the data everywhere. <coughs> One in 13 kids has food allergies. That's nearly two in every classroom. It's the emotional topic. <laughs> Um, nearly 40% of those kids have experienced a severe anaphylactic reaction, and many of those reactions have happened at school. Food allergies are on the rise. Scarborough is seeing more kids, younger kids, 
Um, I recently read in the Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, report that the prevalence of food allergies in children is increased 50% by the late 90s, since the late 90s. So I'm sharing this data, which many of you might be familiar with, <laughs> um, to give us perspective, perspective on the current issue that many families are facing, as well as the significant number of young kids with food allergies who will be starting school in the coming years. As I said earlier, uh, my youngest has food allergies, um, so this topic clearly <laughs> is near and dear to my heart. Uh, my son Kyle is 10 years old and a fifth grader at Wentworth. He has a severe uh, dairy allergy and a life-threatening allergy to peanuts. Mm. And I worry every single day I send him off to school. Um, and I worry when I hear that there's two current food allergy policies that are looking to be removed. Um, I'm definitely here to understand more tonight what that means. Um, I understand the policies are outdated. Um, the one is from, two, I think they're both from 2009. Um, I read through them. You know, they reference things like peanut butter. So thankful we don't have peanut butter sandwiches made anymore. Um, so definitely a lot of strides even since those were created. Um, but they also contain a lot of important information that is not covered under the state law or my son's um, individual health plan. So things like the roles of the bus driver so that I know when he goes back and forth to school every day he's going to be safe or the lesson plans that involve food consumption or even the, custodi the custodial cleaning responsibilities. Mm. <coughs> I understand that the nurses have worked uh, to put together a protocol document. Thank you, it didn't have a chance to read it, but I appreciate you handing it out. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more tonight uh, from them uh, directly around understanding the rationale towards moving in the direction of a protocol versus a policy. Um, I do want to acknowledge in my talk that the nurses are amazing. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly grateful for the unbelievable support and education um, and understanding that they have shown Kyle and my family. And I know Kyle will be fine um, because the current nursing staff is amazing. Um, but if we remove these policies, I worry what's going to happen when their staff turnover in two years or five years or ten years? How does the, implement, how does the implementation of these protocols change? How are they managed? How are they enforced? How do they differ than a policy? So if you remember the data I shared at the beginning, 50% increase in food allergies since the 90s. This is not going away. Scarborough is going to see an increasing number of kids and concerned parents like me. So I'm still worried. And I would ask you to consider tonight if it's really necessary to remove either one or both of these policies. And at minimum, we should strongly consider keeping the food allergy umbrella policy in place. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Hmm. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to recognition. <clears throat> yes, I have one recognition tonight. We recently received notification that one of our middle school uh, teachers, Brenda Risenborough, has been nominated as a Cumberland County Teacher of the Year, and she was nominated by one of a parent, uh, one of the parents of a sixth grader that she teaches, Jill Spina. Um, so now it's really up to Brenda whether or not she wants to pursue the very um, intensive process of pursuing the Teacher of the Year title. Um, but it is a really great professional journey for staff to be on, and we're so proud of Brenda. And just wanted to take a moment to publicly acknowledge her. That's incredible. Spotlight recognition. <laughs> so um, we're happy to announce that this month the Spotlight Award winner is Mary Record. She's here tonight. Um, she is a health and science teacher at Scarborough High School and she has been a member of the Scarborough School <coughs> community since 2009. Am I right? Okay. Um, <laughs> She was nominated for the award by a colleague in recognition of the countless hours she dedicates to keeping our students healthy and safe. Her care and compassion extend well beyond her classroom duties, and for this, we are honored to recognize Mary Record as this month's Spotlight winner. Uh, we have prepared a video for Mary. Um, and before we show it, I do wanna note that um, April from our communications committee went into Scarborough High School um, to film a bunch of clips um, and there were just so many students who came up to her and said how much they love Mrs. Record um, but obviously due to some of the private and personal nature of the help that she offers to students 
and our concerns about maintaining that privacy, we only filmed a few student clips. Um, but I just wanted to point out that there were so many students who came up to April to talk about how much they love Mrs. Record. And without further ado, here's Hold on. our little video. Hold on. Before okay. you start, okay. I have been so Sorry. excited to show you your video. <laughs> Because she thinks she knows who nominated her. Um, <laughs> as usual, the, the person who nominated Mary, so she knew she won, but the person who nominated her is a surprise, so we'll see if you are right. My name's Darren Davis, and I nominated Mary Record. <laughs> she is more than deserving. Um, she deals with kids who are on the verge of crisis a lot of times. She's great working with uh, all the different programs. She keeps capable. <laughs> Everybody feels comfortable talking to her, and that's why she should win. So it's a great thing that Mrs. Record can connect with so many students because she teaches almost everyone here in our building before they graduate from high school. She does a wonderful job and she's a great, great teacher. Thank you, Mrs. Record, for creating a safe space at Scarborough High School. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Record, for everything you've done. Thank you, Mrs. Record, and congratulations on your reward. Thank you for teaching me everything you need to know about the real world. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, inspiring. I think to students and staff alike, um, she just has this amazing way of connecting with kids and it's getting them excited about learning and inspiring their confidence and growth. And she is just a true asset to everyone that works with her. Good job, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> because bacteria is how it <laughs> and birds are really small. Microscopic. Can you see microscopic bacteria? No. No, that is a definition of microscopic because you can't see it. <laughs> She moves around and she's here and she's there and she's using her gestures and then and then the big finish and like the rest of the day he's like <laughs> food poisoning. Food poisoning. Yeah. Um, if you want to stay, you're welcome. But if you want to go, I completely understand because you've had a really long day. Um, but congratulations! Thank you, yes. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> congratulations! Thank you, Congrats. Mary. Great. 
Dylan and Kristen, student representatives report. So to start off, I visited some of the primary schools and the primary schools are celebrating their 100th day of school tomorrow, which is February 8th. Um, all the primary schools are encouraging their students to dress up like they're 100 years old for the <laughs> celebration. Um, in addition, some Blue Point Seriously. kindergartners are yeah. making a book to celebrate um, their accomplishment of making it to 100 days of school. And each page of this book is filled with one of those. So students were encouraged to fill out what they want 100 items of. So the one on the right, I believe, was stuffed animals, and the one on the left, I don't, is that <laughs> like a mouse maybe? <laughs> um, but some of the other students said they wanted 100 Legos, toys, pets, lollipops, and dollar bills. Um, <laughs> and tomorrow the students will be making the same type of pages, but of just things that they wouldn't want 100 of. Oh, that they that wouldn't want 100 of? Yeah, that they wouldn't want 100 of. That's going to be it. <laughs> <laughs> And then last week, Blue Point students started their kindness challenge, and students dressed up with different themes and colors every day of the week to showcase their kindness. Monday was mismatched socks. Tuesday was wearing gear from a sport or activity. Wednesday was crazy hair day. Thursday was <coughs> PJ day, and Friday was blue day. So Blue Point also started their new program called High Five Fridays, which allows students to be greeted on Friday mornings by a Scarborough police officer. And the Storm for a Cure Club at Scarborough High School has started a toiletry drive, and it's a little competition going on between each advisory. Um, advisories are expected to donate toiletries, um, which is like deodorant, combs, toothpaste, shampoo, and conditioner, and all of this will be donated to the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. Um, and the winning advisory that donates the most items gets two dozen holy donuts. And finally, student council and the social workers have been working together to come up with ways to alleviate stress um, in, with students at the high school. And they decided to run daily yoga and mindful relaxation exercises in the back of the auditorium <coughs> during A East and advisory. And these sessions are guided by Molly Montgomery, Bob Roque, and Florence Lusk. And students have loved participating in these mindful moments every morning so far. We're going to jump back to the middle school. Um, this actually I didn't intend on learning about until I <coughs> just happened to sit in one uh, crew time and this was happening. But it was a presentation by Learning Commons. On April 30th at 6 p.m., the Scarborough Middle School Learning Commons will be hosting a Battle of the Books trivial event. Uh, this event was inspired by a neighboring district that challenges students to read the current Main Student Book Award nominations <coughs> and then later compete. Uh, in teams during a trivia game to test their knowledge. Whatever team wins will receive a prize. And I just thought this was a great way to encourage students to read and also an exciting way to earn prizes. And prior to the event, students who read all the books and will be invited to a party after school or during school, I'm not sure when, but uh, to vote for the school book award. Plus also they'll be able to enjoy a delicious yogurt parfait bar. <laughs> I thought that was pretty fancy. Um, it's that time of year again. The high school quiz show of Maine is going to begin airing tonight at 8 p.m. The, these photos are from this current upcoming season. Uh, I was just shared them recently, and I thought I might share them with you. But you may be asking, when can I watch it? Um, they will be airing on, well, tonight's the first episode at 8 p.m. <coughs> Assuming we win, um, the next upcoming shows will be April 4th, May 2nd, and then finally the championship is on May 16th. All of them are at 8 p.m. on Maine Public Television. In case you're too busy watching this school board meeting tonight and you can't see it today, they are always at 5 p.m. the following Sunday. So you can catch it this Sunday at 5 p.m. because nothing better to do. Um, it's a lot of fun. They're all high school, uh, all different grades in the high school. Um, and if you see on there, it says number one seed for our team. I actually, I asked Eric Youth about this, and he said that that means that they got number one in the pre-qualifying rounds out of <laughs> all of the schools that are participating for the entire show. So that's like 30 teams, I think. 
so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, <coughs> this I thought was kind of fun. The buddy system did right before midterms. They had a whole afternoon where they made a bunch of different posters and signs, uh, encouraging all the students to do good on their midterm and study and like not worry and don't stress. And you can still see a bunch of them today. They're all over the school. But this was one good way to kind of calm everyone down. And there were, I think they made like 300 posters. It was pretty amazing. This, it is not a student group, but it did kind of go along with our district guiding principles, so I thought I'd share. Um, three, these are, this is a photo of three seniors uh, from the latest Women's March. They were, they, and there were some few other students there, but <coughs> not in this photo. They're acting as leaders to improve their community. This, I just thought this was one really cool thing that you don't get to see every day, and we're trying to encourage our students to do more of this. And then finally, there was a winter ball recently. Ball is loose term. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they had a ball last Saturday. Um, there's not much to say, but I did think I'd show a few photos. It looked pretty fun. These photos were taken by one of the student photographers, Jacob Lewis, if any of you have heard of him. Yep. He takes all of the photos for the entire yearbook. It seems like it. He takes yep. so many great photos. <laughs> But that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to 7.0, superintendent's report. Yes, so given that it's our first meeting of the month, is it the first meeting of the month? First meeting of the month, I'll share our enrollment report. So you can see here. Um, our enrollment is up three students overall, and it shows you kind of the plus or minus at each grade level um, with no change at Blue Point again this month. Um, and then this also shows you our previous enrollment study. Um, we do now have our new enrollment study, and I believe our Long Range facility is in uh, agreement in terms of what numbers that we'll use. So next month we will add those numbers here so you can see how we're faring comparative. And I think for a couple of months, um, it'll be interesting to show the 2016 best fit new housing, and then the 2018, um, which one are we deciding? Best fit plus, best fit plus the high multi-family impact. Yeah. So we'll have to get that coding in there. Um, and then we'll start to show this. So as you know, we continue to, we monitor enrollment every month, every week really, particularly during budget time when we're preparing for um, some really strategic decision making. Uh, so that's our enrollment. <clears throat> And then I'm going to ask um, some of our members of our attendance um, and truancy committee to come up and speak <coughs> with you a bit about the flyer that you see. That brightly colored flower flyer was created by um, Principal Meadow at the middle school. And um, really what we're trying to do is just begin communicating more with our community about attendance and how, why attendance matters. And so our improvement strategist, Kathy Terrell, will walk you through what you have in front of you. Um, and the timeline for when this will go up to families. Hi, I am Kathy Terrell. I'm the improvement strategist. Um, so our leadership team, we wanted to share this um, attendance communication flyer with you. So a little background. Last year when we um, completed our comprehensive needs assessment, attendance came up as an area that we wanted to look at. And also, um, the state of Maine um, for the Every Student Succeeds Act is also using chronic absenteeism as one of its measures of student success. Um, so in September, Joanne Sizemore <laughs> formed an attendance and truancy steering committee made up of an administrator from each phase level and an administrator from special education. And we attended a training by um, the law offices of Drummond and Woodson. We've also been using um, resources such as Attendance Matters and the School Leader's Guide to Tackling Attendance <coughs> Challenges as we do research on the topic. In the Winter District Newsletter, there was an article on chronic absenteeism and why it matters. 
And so this is our next parent communication, this flyer, and we wanted you to take a look at it. So as I was reading the School Leaders Guide to Tackling Attendance Challenges, I had a big aha as they talked about just regular attendance. You know, we've been kind of looking at what's our chronic absenteeism numbers. We want those under 5%, but when you think about regular attendance, we really would like our regular attendance to be 100%, but getting to 80 or 90% would be wonderful. And as a district, we're at 68%. So that is a student missing no more than nine days. And so we really have looked at, you know, how can we as a leadership strengthen some of our universal practices? We know we need to collect more data on why students are absent so we can dig in um, to higher um, levels and problems under like tier two and three, but we want to focus on some of these tier one or universal. So that's one of the reasons why um, you know we want to put out the flyer. So why does attendance matter? These are just a few of many reasons, but students who are chronically absent in primary grades often continue to have attendance issues throughout their school career. Um, all students' academic growth is affected when classrooms have higher absenteeism <coughs> rates and teachers spend more time reteaching in these cases. Um, students who are chronically absent tend to have lower grade point averages and test scores as compared to students with regular attendance. And um, a lot of absences also make it harder to make those connections with teachers and students because you're not in school. And then we wanted to just share some things we could do and start to do to make a change. And so there are three categories. What can the school do, parents and students? And one of the things we're working on um, in leadership is how do we promote a climate that is consistently welcoming and positive for all students? Looking at our parent communications and the letters that go home and making sure that they're welcoming. Um, ensure that meaningful work is going on, reinforce the value of attendance, address both academic and social emotional needs, and systematically monitor absence data, so putting in some practices that we're being very consistent with looking at our data, <coughs> and celebrate students with regular or improved attendance, and also partnering with families to create action plans when attendance becomes difficult. Because there are going to be times when students are out for a variety of reasons that they can't help, and how can we as a school help those students be successful? Um, and parents, you know, if we ask if they could reinforce the value of regular school attendance, establish regular habits at home for homework, sleep, and morning routines, create expectations for the use of technology, talk regularly and identify potential areas of stress. Oftentimes when a student doesn't want to come to school, it might be anxiety and how can you deal with the stress. Um, monitor the number of absences your child has had. Nine can creep up on you pretty quickly. That's just two days a month um, and one day a month one day a month, and <clears throat> chronic absenteeism is 18 days, which is two days a month, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then plan appointments and vacations with school schedules in mind. And what can students do? Um, make attending school regularly <coughs> a personal priority, follow regular routines at home, stay on top of their academic responsibilities and progress, <laughs> Get involved in the life of school by participating in activities, and it is wonderful that the high school, middle school, Wentworth, they have a lot of after school activities. Um, limit screen time and talk frequently <laughs> with adults, both parents and school staff. That's why those school relationships are so important. And seek out help from others when issues come up. And there are more, but we could only fit so many on the flyer. Diane, do you have anything to add? 
So we'll, we'll keep you up to date as we work on this and share some of the practices and things we um, talk about. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Yeah. <clears throat> so this will just be another communication. Again, we're trying to layer our communications and have them be repetitive. So we're creating an ongoing conversation about various topics that are important to improving outcomes for kids. I do have a question. Sure. Um, where it says that we're at 68% with regular attendance, where do we fit with the rest of the state? In terms of our regular attendance, mm -hmm. um, that's part of the analysis that we plan to do, is comparing ourselves to others. Um, we did have a community member who started to look at what some of our other, um, who's here in the audience tonight, uh, John Kluge, who um, starting to look at, you know, what are other schools that we mm -hmm. often compare ourselves, what do their attendance rates look like? Um, and that's an important benchmark for us to keep in mind. But the bottom line is we need to really think about our kids and how often are our kids regularly attending school and also looking at staff attendance, how regularly are staff attending school um, and what are some of the um, factors behind chronic absenteeism both for the students and the staff. And I, would, I would just add that we know it's public data. Um, what other schools <laughs> chronic absenteeism but we don't know they're approaching and so it's hard for us to compare our regular okay. and you know we had been looking at just the chronic and the approaching and hadn't really looked at that regular so that is gives you a lot of knowledge of how many kids are coming mm -hmm. thank you Nick? Well, just to kind of dovetail off what you said, I mean, this last bubble stood out to me because it really emphasizes the importance mm -hmm. of non-traditionally academic benefits to school, you know, making those meaningful connections. And that's true not just for student absenteeism, but for staff absenteeism yeah. as, as well. So I often hear parents or people I know that have kids say things like, well, we went on vacation because that's an experience that's so valuable and one week of school isn't that big of a deal. But that's a loss of a connection potentially that mm -hmm. I think sometimes families don't always realize how important that is. So thank you for adding that to this specifically. Mm -hmm. and, and similarly, Nick, the, the impact on the classroom. So yeah. if your family takes week one and my family takes week two and Leanne's family takes week three and there's never Absolutely. the full student you know, classroom <coughs> together, um, there's a real missed opportunity for building strong social connections. Um, forgive me if I missed it. How was this um, distributed? It hasn't been yet. Okay. You guys are getting the first preview, and then it'll go out to all family. Um, is our timeline, have we decided on the timeline yeah, for when it'll go out? We just knew we wanted to share it with awesome. you first. But it'll go Thank home you. in the um, distribution emails that at each school. That each school sends. I just want to thank everybody who's involved in this for all the work you've done on this already um, and all the work that you will do as you move forward trying to develop support systems to improve mm -hmm. some of the absenteeism that's going on. And I, I really like the handout. It's, it looks great. So thanks. <laughs> thank you. 7.3, the Greater Sebago Educational Alliance. Um, so I don't necessarily have a slide for this. I really just wanted to bring this back to the board. Remember back in December, Mick Roy, the executive director of the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, came and spoke with all of you about the benefits of being a part of that regional service center. Um, as we all know, um, back in June, that was question one on the local ballot, not to be confused with question one that was on the state ballot, um, and it did not successfully pass here in Scarborough. And so instantly um, upon it not passing the forty thousand dollars that was supplemental funding to our district was taken back by the department of education because we were not a part of that regional service center and fy 20 the amount of that um, supplemental allocation increases to eighty thousand um, which is a teaching position or two educational technician positions just to kind of put it into context um, and what I recently learned from the Department of Education is that because the school board did <laughs> successfully vote on the interlocal agreement back in May of 2017 in preparation for the referendum vote, the language in the local uh, interlocal agreement, as you all have read, states that a, the regional service center can allow another um, school district to enter that agreement once established um, with just a local school board vote. 
And so I know that we had talked about putting it back on the ballot in June in hopes that this time with more communication it would pass. I just wanted to bring it back to the board and let you know you do have this other option and let you have that discussion publicly about what the pros and the cons might be for that. Um, I did reach out to Jennifer Pooler, who oversees this department um, at the Department of Education, and asked if she would be willing to come and speak um, to the board directly, but she wasn't available tonight. She did share some information, which has also been shared with the board chair. Um, the other thing I think it, that's important for our community to know is that the rules to, um, there are some proposed revisions to the rules in Chapter 123, which is the, the, ch the law that um, addresses regional service centers, um, which is looking to change the way that communities approve regional service center participation. Um, I don't know if there's anything you would want to add to that, mm -hmm. Leanne. Mm -mm. So I, I think it, I just wanted to give you all a chance to really kind of grapple with this and think mm -hmm. about it. What are the pros and cons of waiting till June? Um, what could be the benefits of the board taking action sooner? I think anecdotally what I have heard in conversations, and I know many of you have shared this, is that there was a lot of confusion with the busy ballot in June um, and the confusion with it being called question one even though it was on the local ballot because there was a lot of, you know, like stop the scam signs for question one that was, you know, relative to the state question one. You mean um, November, Julie, November. Right? November. November. Yeah. What do I keep saying? June. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so, sorry. Um, and so, I've heard people say like, oh, I didn't really understand that. Someone even said to Toadie they thought it was about creating a career technical education center in Scarborough. Um, that is not what being a member of the Regional Service Center is about, as you all know. I'm happy to like publicly explain the benefits of it again if that's something that the board think is ne thinks is necessary. But with that, I would just turn it over to all of you um, for discussion. I, okay, so I'll start. Um, <laughs> you um, the first step. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my instant thought is that, and we have talked openly with the public about how we think there was some, um, the, the climate of our school district at the time, probably when people saw anything, do you want to approve X for the school, people were like, ooh, I don't know, let's wait. And we talked about how that could have been part of this, as, as well as language for state and, and other ballot issues. My, my gut is that I, I hate to kind of take advantage of a rule that would go against the vote of the public. Mm -hmm. I think right now that would be a challenging move for this board. Um, but I would actually like to ask, what, what are the fiscal implications? So I know we've talked about how the, the $40,000 stipend and then the $80,000 mm -hmm. stipend. Our cost for joining this is not nearly close to that, right? It's $1,000. So it's a net gain of like seventy nine grand in, in FY20. Plus shared services. And I, if you remember, in November, I gave the example of just the crucial conversations, professional right. development, and cost us $75 per participant as opposed to it would have been, you know, at least three to $4,000 for us to host yeah. it ourselves. I think it, it's... Go ahead. So is it safe to assume... <laughs> so I, I know from the conversation from the presentation we had that they kind of grandfathered us uh, in a sense into the program and are allowing us to have participation pending approval yeah. you know a voter approval mm -hmm. is it are we to assume that if it does not pass a second time that we're out I think that would be true. This okay. has been very much an extension on our goodwill as a goodwill. district because we have been a part of the Sebago Educational Alliance for over a decade or more. Mm -hmm. um, and really, we were critical thought partners in some of the way the application was developed um, and in some of the programming that's currently going to be offered or is being developed. Um, and so that's why they've allowed us to continue to be a part. We do attend the meetings monthly. <coughs> However, we don't have any voting power. Um, so when decisions are made, we, we obviously abstain from voting. The, in terms of Nick's question, what are the financial implications? So we're anticipating that sometime in February we'll receive our initial EB 279, which is um, the form that we get from the state that tells us what our allocation will be, our, our general purpose aid or GPA allocation will be this year. Um, I believe, my understanding is that it will show the 80000 under on the last page under supplemental funding because we've committed to being a potential partner. Um, Leanne and I um, sent that agreement to the state back in December. Late, early December. Um, 
And so they have acknowledged that. And that's what really sparked this conversation um, because then Jennifer Pooler was asking, so have you communicated back to your board? Is there any, is there any will to move forward? And then I kind of kicked it back to Leanne and said, what do you think? Is this something we would want to consider? Um, kind of think, thinking really along the same lines that Nick was expressing earlier. And I figured it was worth a shot to at least have the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, either way, it's a dangerous move. We are, we need to make sure that we're communicating this very, very well during the budget series, season um, and getting this on the ballot to ensure that we don't lose that $80,000 kickback. That's not quite the right word, but incentive. <coughs> incentive. To, incentive. Um, plus the increased PD costs professional development, as well as other shared services costs that we're going to have to pay more if we are part of this cooperative. I think, I, I, I certainly wouldn't deny the benefits of being in the GSEA. And I, I mean, I originally voted for us to be in it before the referendum. I, I, I could not, though, see myself voting. I mean, as much as we might say this is what we think voters were thinking, the bottom line is that it was not approved and I'm not I'm certainly not personally willing to vote <coughs> to override a, pub, a, 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 a public vote. Um, I'm much more comfortable with trying to get the information out there and having a re-vote because, I mean, really, we originally asked people what they thought, and I think it would be really disingenuous for us to say, well, you didn't really know what you were talking about, so we're just going to override you. I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. I agree. Julie, if, if the money... If the vote happens in June, and um, do we still get, the, and it's yes, do we get the 80,000 or no? Yes, that's okay. my understanding that we okay. would still, yeah. And I, I, do, I do also think that if anyone was considering the board taking an action prior to the June vote, there is still a way for you to give public notice, engage the public, have public hearings, um, and, and solicit feedback from the community. Um, with good communication. Yeah, sure. I, I share Nick and Hillary's concern, absolutely. Um, that seems, I, I don't know, it, it's, that, that would be really tough to do for me. Um, I, with that said, I absolutely <laughs> want Scarborough in this alliance. I, I mean, I, I think it's the right move. I think it's a lot of money. Um, and I, I absolutely think it's a no-brainer to be in that alliance, but that's not what our community told us. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the other thing I would say is that, um, I haven't read the local agreement in a while, so I, I, I had no idea that we were going to be asked to kind of weigh in on this tonight. So I would have really have liked to know that maybe I should review the local agreement so I can read the language that you're talking about, Julie, in terms of school boards having that authority seems strange to me that um, something would have to go to referendum and then school board has the opportunity to override the referendum vote. That just seems really counter to why we have referendum. So, right. I mean, I'd be certainly willing to talk about this further, but I, it just, something just does not feel right to me about taking a vote back from the community. And the intent of tonight was not for the board to take any action. It was just to start the conversation and see if it's something that you want to continue to pursue in a really public way. I asked that exact same question when I was emailing back to the DOE, like, help me understand how this makes any sense. And the rationale is really because now the GSA has been operational since July 1, 2018, where at the time when we were taking the vote, they, had, they were not yet fully operational. And so that's where it triggers a different um, aspect of, mm -hmm. of 123. And, and although, perf although that there is um, proposed legislation to, to change Chapter 123, even if it were approved, you, you then have a 90-day um, period unless it's approved under like emergency circumstances before it's actually enacted. So mm -hmm. again, just thinking about the timeline of things in the budget process. Is, is, there, is there an opportunity to make a decision to approve it pending a referendum vote in June? Like, you know, like approve it now, but, but, we did I mean, that. does that we, make we, sense? Yeah, I mean, we kind of already did yeah. that, right? Yeah. Which is, like, again, that's, yeah. <laughs> that, does, that seems strange. Yeah. yeah. 
So you, that happened really in two ways. One, back in May when the board approved the okay. interlocal agreement, right. um, and then it happened again in early December when we agreed to sign the potential member mm -hmm. roster. Right. And that was really for planning purposes from the department's um, standpoint because they have to know how to allocate the funding. Because remember, this is not a separate or additional pot of money. It's coming from the same um, pot as general purpose aid. And I, I apologize for not having sent forwarded that email. I just sent it over. Um, it got caught up in a couple of other things. So sorry that you didn't have that in advance. But this really was just a open conversation of what the opportunities were for us. Definitely not to take a motion to make this <laughs> well advanced of hearing what the, what the community would want as well as what the board would want. So it was way premature to consider a motion. Yes, sir. It seems like one, one thing is clear though for us as a group is that is motion or not, it sounds like between now and June, we've got an important thing in front of us because it sounds like we're all in agreement this is something that would really benefit our district and come June, if the public were to say no again for whatever reason, then we're really in a challenging position. And so I think now our, our, our goal is clear and that is to get the, the word out so that our public can, can make a, a decision that I think many of us believe they want to make and, and we can move forward in, in a different way. So our mission is clear. Yeah. Agree. Thank you. Agree. I have nothing to add. We live in a democracy. <laughs> they voted, and I don't think it's our role. It would be irresponsible of us to go against that. Okay. Any okay. other comments on that? Okay. Um, Seven point four: the K twelve curriculum and technology overview. I would like to introduce our Director of Curriculum and Assessment, Monique Culbertson, and our Interim Information Technology Director, Michelle Lemlin. They're going to take us on a little journey um, tonight, a little bit back in time and a little bit to the present day and maybe a little bit fast forward to the future as we think about the role that technology plays in our curriculum and our day-to-day -day delivery of high-quality instruction. So with that, Monique. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, we're here to provide a little bit of an overview of how both have changed over time. Uh, gone are the days when you could just hand out the slates and the chalk <laughs> and the books. Uh, and I say that, um, and I uh, sincerely thank the Scarborough Historical Society who helped us put some of the visuals <laughs> together for this. Actually, these photos were taken by um, some Scarborough Middle School students, and I'll explain that a little bit more um, in a moment. Um, but curriculum and technology have always had a partnership. Uh, from uh, on the left there, you see the devices that students are using, but we still have books in the classroom, uh, lots of books, but we also have other sorts of pieces of equipment and supplies in our classrooms, um, all sorts of gadgets and tools, <coughs> low but effective tech. Paper is a piece of technology as well as furniture and our environment, our learning environment, all help us to deliver the curriculum. In those buildings where space is tight at the K2s, we put our maker space cart um, together and we roll it to the students at the point of learning. Here's another visual there of students working with all the stuff around the curriculum. Down in the lower left is some high tech robotics equipment that's part of our technology that's part of our curriculum. And then in the middle there is um, a device and specialized equipment for students to be able to access our curriculum. And on the right there is a middle school science lab. And so it's the space as well as all the stuff in it that constitutes the technology to support <coughs> our curriculum. Now, as I was poking around the main memory network, I found the perfect example for this presentation and happened oh to have been put together by a group of Scarborough Middle School students in 2010. They worked on a community heritage project with both the state and the local historical societies but also the main memory network. So this student project was actually a project around looking at all the components of how classrooms have changed over time. And it's a wonderful example because it's an authentic, relevant project. And this is exactly the kind of a project we want our students involved in, in terms of using technology in our curriculum. And we will post this um, slide deck on the website and there is a link so you can actually look at the online digital exhibit that these students put together in 2010. Uh, the topics were fascinating. They included everything from furniture, what it looked like back then to today, to graduation, to heat, to books, to school lunch, very important topic in our, um, in our schools, homework, technology, and curriculum as well. So for example, in describing the furniture and how furniture has changed over time, <coughs> this young student ended 
with the statement today, portable, today, 2010, portable desks and tables are common in schools, interaction among students is expected, and the teacher is no longer the center of attention, the learning is. So I could wrap this presentation up right about now. Um, the students have said it just beautifully. Um, <clears throat> In and around technology, please understand the middle school was the first school in the district to have the one-to-one -one, uh, laptops. Uh, so um, the student presentation here ended with all these technolog technological tools are essential for students and teachers on a daily basis. But I want to remind you that it's more than computers. Um, it's also the science equipment. It's also the straws. It's the blocks. It's the musical instruments. It's the protractors. There's quite a bit of supplies for curriculum. But in the area of curriculum, um, you would be maybe surprised to know that back in about 1915, there were only two required courses each year at Scarborough High School. What do you think, Kristen and Dylan? Just two courses. <laughs> Luckily today, there's a program of studies that's rich with lots of course offerings for students. Uh, but we're also working K through eight to expand our curriculum, particularly in the areas of STEM. And we will, you will see a budget proposal um, in place around expanding offerings for students at the high school, particularly in um, the area of robotics and engineering, but also the career pathways piece. So we're looking K through 12 to expand our curriculum. Um, so curriculum programming has changed um, from about <coughs> 1912. You can see the chalkboard. Um, the um, curriculum there was mostly books, chalks, chalkboard, the furniture. Um, all the way to even 1971, where Scarborough High School um, had a Future Homemakers of America program. 1971 was not too far off from my high school graduation date. Um, and I would like to thank the Scarborough Historical Society. We laugh now, but it was appropriate and pertinent for the time. That's what we do with curriculum. Um, but we're, we are changing. I want to reassure the public we are changing. Um, and we move forward thoughtfully and carefully as our budget allows. And I would like to reach out and really thank the Scarborough Historical Society for helping out in doing the research and providing the photos for us for this presentation. So there are a range of technologies. Uh, and it has evolved. For example, on the right-hand side, that is a small classroom space of reading support where there are lots of books in that space, but there's also an interactive uh, projector, a short throw projector, and that board has assignments, <coughs> information, you, students can access the internet, and they use a stylus to capture the screen and to work from. Um, down below, there is a whole range of technology. There is everything from a laptop to specialized furniture and equipment for students to be able to access the curriculum there. And I have certainly seen from books, publishers started to put software together. It came on a floppy drive or a CD. Now it's a download, and now we've got Chrome extensions and we've got apps. It's coming in all sorts of forms in terms of the software. We've had software where students produce um, their work and it's saved on a particular device. Now things are saved remotely and in the cloud. And there's an any time, any place, any pace learning and curriculum that we're looking at offering our students. Again, our plan and technology has been at the point of learning. So for example, you'll see a STEM lab at Wentworth School where we provide all the equipment that they need in order to deliver that programming. Um, and students will go to that lab to access the technology for their learning. But within a classroom down <coughs> on the right, we have the laptops at Wentworth in a charging station right in the classroom. They don't have to go to the technology anymore. The technology is there at the point of learning and it's mobile. That was also a 3D printer <coughs> there, and we have um, an example of the Lion King here that was printed off one of the 3D printers. So curriculum programming has also changed. We have a range of students, and we work hard, very hard, to meet all of their needs so they can access the curriculum. So we have all kinds of student support services, everything from guidance to occupational therapy to functional life skills to our co-curriculars that we offer. And as such, because of the functions and the range of services we offer, the spaces and the spaces have changed. So you'll notice in that top photo, you'll notice there are different kinds of seats that students can choose to sit in. So we differentiate in lots of different levels in order to make sure that our students are at, um, have the conditions ready for learning. 
Down on the left, there's some specialized equipment and furniture for students there so they can take part in some occupational physical therapy. That middle photo is a middle school learning commons. That's a space where we provide lots of opportunity for students. They can present. There's a short throw presenter in the presentation board in there. There's space for small groups to work. There's spaces for large groups to work. On the right-hand side, that's an example of a classroom, a math support classroom at the middle school, another small space where we work with students at their um, accessing the curriculum. Also, uses change. These photos show you an example of that. We need spaces where students can engage individually. That child on the left is engaged in um, coding activity, but then the students on the right-hand side of the screen are working together to program a robot. And then in the middle, we need large spaces for students to test out their um, robot and their programming for their robots. So within the curriculum, there's lots of technology. So how we're organized to support that, we have an IT department that provides the hardware and the infrastructure, the pipeline, the internet pipeline. But also, they support the productivity software, our operating systems, and certain productivity software. The curriculum department focuses on the instructional software. So in terms of the devices that we have, I'm going to talk a little bit about the instructional devices because that's a big piece of that, being a one-to-one -one district. Um, students at the K2, they have a Chromebook that's touch screen. What we do before we do our refresh of devices, we do a functional assessment. We talk to the classroom teachers to find out what the <coughs> student's needs are. We have a sense of the types of software. We pilot some devices. We actually bring those sample devices to the students and have them try them out with the software and get feedback from the actual students before we make a final decision on student devices. Likewise, we do that with the staff as well for their devices. And so for future devices, the 3-5 is moving to Chromebooks. The middle school has had their first year with the Chromebooks, and the high school will be working on doing their functional assessment for what all students need for their devices. Now, at the high school, and even in some departments at the middle school, there are specialized programs, for example, at the high school, in the art labs. We have desktops there with higher end um, capabilities given what the art program needs to do. Uh, John McHugh teaches a course in Microsoft certification, so he has a cart of laptops with the proper software and the computing power to do that. So we also provide specialized equipment. This is just the devices across the board for students. This is a list of teacher devices, the hardware that teachers use. Again, we go through that functional assessment to provide the device that's going to best meet their needs to deliver the curriculum. There's all sorts of other hardware that is supported. We have document cameras, we have 3D printers, laptop, the carts, the classroom projectors. All of those pieces of equipment are supported by a rather small, a very efficient, wonderful IT department. <coughs> Um, even the printers are evolving, so we're constantly trying to keep up. That printer down there on the right was a simple desk jet printer that was hooked up to one laptop or one computer over time. We've moved to network printing, which we've increased the functionality in terms of being able to offer um, scanning as well, and we can now scan to Google Drive, so we can, again, tr seek some efficiencies in reducing the paper. And on the left there is one of the new uh, 3D printers that we are piloting and testing. I'd like to turn it over to Michelle, who will talk about how she works. She and her department works very hard at helping to support the curriculum efforts. Thank you, Amy. Good evening. This is a list of fees at every <laughs> phase level. These funds help with the cost of repairs and replacement of student devices throughout the year. The fees are evaluated at each tech refresh. Maintenance fees can be paid online through RevDrive. The maintenance fees cover all accidental damage, drops, spills, cracked screens. The items that are not covered are, int are intentional damage, accessories, the chargers, theft, fire, and loss of device. The structure. As the number of devices have increased, we realized that our staffing structure needed to shift to provide better support in a more cost-effective <coughs> manner. With over 1,300 devices per school at Wentworth Middle School and High School, and 300 devices at each K school, K2 school, it's important that we provide support to the classrooms during school hours. The solution was to transfer three ed tech positions to the IT department as field techs. 
This provides a support position in each school, 3 through 12, one individual that rotates to each K-2 school during the school week. The staff. The field tech supervisor is Mark Keyes. He's been with us for 20 years. Derek Staten has been with us for over four years and is the lead field tech in warranty work as well as audio visual. Maria Serencino started in the district as an ed tech at Wentworth School and was transitioned over to the field technician. Austin Merritt, Zach Lachance, and on the school side, Jeannie Regan are new to the district. This team is not only responsible <coughs> for the schools they have been assigned, but they are cross-trained to fill in for each other. The team meets monthly with the tech coaches to identify trends and issues with software and hardware. We couldn't ask for a better team. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the software end of things, um, but as you can see, it's a collaborative effort. Um, I work with the technology coaches. We have a technology coach at each phase level, and so the tech techs and the technology coaches work quite closely together. The technology instructional coaches help the classroom teachers learn about the software and how to effectively use it in the classroom with the students. We use Google for education, and we provide access to different features within that Google suite to our students, depending on their developmental levels and what they're um, able and capable of doing within Google Education. And that is a cost efficiency moving off of the Microsoft products. <coughs> um, we manage about 100 or so applications, including the productivity applications. Uh, I focus mostly on the instructional applications. But there is a process there that we go through in terms of researching the software, it being recommended from cl for classroom teachers, from the classroom teacher level. Um, we also work hard at implementing, making sure it works on our systems. Um, we do quite a bit of research on that in terms of the purpose, the terms of use, the cost, the compatibility, the functionality of that. We negotiate the terms for the mm -hmm. licensing. Then we begin an implementation plan, which involves um, the tech coaches. But then we have to manage it, because what's happening now is the software will update and not tell us, or something else within our systems will update and we have to constantly be monitoring those pieces. Um, we also want to monitor the use of those applications and pieces, and that's part of that role of that K-12 technology specialist for usage, functionality. What's the impact on students? Are students learning more or better as a result? Uh, and then we will phase that out, or we will add that into the system. Um, <clears throat> our new tech request, the big question is, does it fit in the curriculum? Is it necessary for the curriculum? Cost is always a concern, and is it compatible with our systems? Um, we don't want to be in a situation where we enter into a subscription <laughs> agreement and it doesn't work on our operating system. We also need to review the terms of service, but also, most importantly, the student data privacy on that. As you know, the fine print when you accept the terms of service, we get to read all those words all the way down to make sure that on our end and on their end, we have an agreement that we can live with. Student data privacy is a huge concern for us because of the information that goes out. Uh, and so what we do is we've um, most recently, um, and Jen Lim was part of establishing this in the state, is um, districts have gotten into said, look, we've all got to come together here and work with these software companies because um, our data, there was out of concern of the data. So we developed this <coughs> consortium and we contracted with uh, Drummond Woodson to develop a student data privacy agreement, a generic agreement that meets our needs so that we can be assured that our student data is private and remains so. And so we have a process by which we send out those agreements. We're in the process of looking at all of our renewals and sending out this privacy agreement to all of our vendors to see if they can abide by that. If they don't abide by that, we have a decision to make whether or not we're gonna to continue to contract with them. And there are some steps that we do take. Um, our students are trained not to provide their personal information online in any case, and so we have ways of using software applications and limiting the amount of information that is released. But this is an area of uh, importance to us. Future plans moving down the road. Again, it's a continuous um, collaborative effort. We meet weekly um, to talk about what's going on, the projects that are in the pipeline, what's happening with students. Wentworth next year, students will be receiving their new um, Chromebooks. High school, it will be the year after. 
for the students, and so they're about in the process of starting that functional assessment. Uh, if you know anything about technology, um, the sunset of Flash um, has having a huge impact on some of our subscriptions, and we've been analyzing our subscriptions to find out who has Flash, whether or not those vendors are going to be updating their software to HTML5 or not, uh, and then looking for some other solutions for our teachers and our students. We're always looking to streamline our process to be a little bit more efficient in order to help support teachers, uh, and we're also looking to seek efficiencies, and again, all in <coughs> order to maximize learning for our students through our curriculum. Thank you so much. I feel like I just gave you a nickel tour um, uh, through this huge area of what curriculum and the role technology plays in curriculum has become, um, but we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, I thank you. That was great. I, I have a, a question about the, the privacy piece. Um, I, I, I the data um, piece. I um, wondering with how privacy with our footprint is really a big issue in today's world. Do, are you having a lot of parents who who ask about that in the schools in terms of how how privacy is protected? Are there lots of concerns around that? Yes, we, what we do is we do informational sessions at each, and we do some data privacy presentations. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think there'll be one at the middle school coming <coughs> up next month or so. Um, and what we do, what we're finding is that some parents, um, parents of younger students mm -hmm. seem to be a bit more aware mm -hmm. um, of that. Maybe it's the generation, I'm not sure. Um, but as we're educating parents, um, parents will become aware <coughs> and they do like to be involved and um, know exactly what's going on. And we try and inform folks of all the software that we have and those pieces. And that site that you saw, mm -hmm. I want to be able to put all of our software pieces of software eventually on that site so parents can go to that site and see exactly what we're using and what the agreements are. That's great. Thanks. That's the end goal. Any other questions? I just have, um, so if you look at the structure that you were talking about, Michelle, um, mm -hmm. is that, I just wanted to point out what I, well, I guess <coughs> I just wanted to ask. Is this the restructuring that we were able to do with the investment that we yes. put into the budget from last year? Okay. And so that's working out? Yes, it's working out great. Great, okay. Mm -hmm. And then this is silly, but why, like, is the high school damage and maintenance fee six, like $60 and the middle school is only 25 and what was only 10 Okay, so it goes by when the students start taking the devices home. Okay. So K2 is nothing because they have, they're not allowed to bring them home. Right. $10 at Wentworth, that's when the kids start carrying them around to different uh -huh. classes. The middle school has a Chromebook, so that's not as expensive. When we oh. went to the high school, it was a Windows laptop, so it was more expensive, <coughs> and that's why it was high. Okay. So would you anticipate if the high school shows a different like if they went to Chromebooks, that that fee would go down? It would depend on the device and the cost. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this was really just part one of the curriculum presentation. <laughs> Monique will come back to you next month, I believe, to um, present the curriculum guide that I know Hillary's gonna give a sneak peek on during her committee report. And also, you will have an action item um, after that presentation, which will be to approve the program of studies. Not, not tonight. No, at the next presentation. Chair report. So I kind of have <coughs> a position, and there's no graphics tonight. Um, but there are some committee and liaison updates to share. First, I have stepped down from finance. Alicia, thank you so much for taking that on. I really appreciate it. Um, and as we talked tonight with the GSEA, finance is probably the most important committee. Um, it is the backbone of everything that we do, so thank you for taking that. Um, town Council, um, they have a liaison to the school board, and we in turn are also going to have a liaison to them, really building that relationship between the two groups. And April, thank you for taking that. Um, so you'll be working with Paul and their team and providing updates to us about what's happening at the town council level. Um, quick update regarding the superintendent search. 
The feedback survey asking what qualities do the community want. That is open until Friday the 15th, so if you have not yet completed it, please do. Um, the search committee application. So we are asking for community members if they wanted to be part of the interview first phase um, to fill out a survey intake form. And that's open until Monday the 25th. So if you have not done that, please contact either myself or Kelly to get the link. And lastly, the public forum is this Monday, the 11th at 5.30 at the, <coughs> the high school cafeteria. Um, MSMA will be here and it will be leading us through, again, the qualities. What are we looking for with the superintendent search? Um, so that's gonna be an open forum at 5.30 at the high school and it's open to everybody. Now, <clears throat> we, yes. Um, will there be more communication about the, sur or the survey and <coughs> the search committee application to parents? I mean, I know yes. there's been one, but I'm just wondering if you're going to reiterate that yes. and also put it on Facebook. And um, I believe that it is on our website now. Um, there should be something in the leader. I picked mine up today. I just didn't get a chance to open it up. Um, but there should be an ad notifying folks of the form as well as we're hoping that the letter itself was printed. Um, but yes, I think, Kelly, we can get that out with social media through Twitter and Facebook just to get that push out there and get the communication through. And thank you for reminding me. Can, can we send another email out too? Sure. And maybe do the same for staff just mm -hmm. to remind them that the deadlines are coming up? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, we talked, I believe it was the beginning of January, um, about the town charter, specifically when the elections of school board members occur. Our elections are in November, the school year's already started, we're trying to get up to speed, and by the time the board has started doing its work, the school year's halfway over. Um, we are one of the anomalies in the state. Most school boards are elected in June. Um, and Dylan, thank you so much for your research on this piece. After that meeting, he went, he went through the Scarborough Town Charter and found that the school board can ask town council to start early and bring this to referendum at our request, which is a huge moment for us. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually talked, I've reached out to Paul um, and they said yes, that is their understanding of the charter as well. So if the board agrees, we can ask the town council to look at what it would take to have a change to the charter for our elections for school board members to occur in June when the budget vote occurs as well. So I'm going to open that up for conversation. With that, I, I, I think I can, I think my well, understanding obviously was the difference between June and November, but um, would we be looking to do this for June of, I want to make sure I get this year right, June of 20? Yeah. I believe so. So we probably we hold this round in November, mm -hmm. and then June of mm -hmm. twenty we'd look at. Okay. Yes. Um, so that would really be impacting Hillary and I's term, um, because we'd be the next ones that would be up for election <laughs> at that point. Um, if everyone is in agreement. Well, and whoever's yes. elected in November would have a, a longer, slightly longer term. Yes, they would have a slightly. Longer the term. devil is in the details on all of that. Like, yeah. Right in terms of so do you think the town council has some leeway in terms of how to move forward in terms of who's already sitting right. and who will be elected in mm -hmm. terms of like writing their term links since they would be different than those of us who are already elected right so do you mean that there would be a referendum as to whether to change the as to whether to change the date of the vote or that would just be changed? I think that is just changed when it comes to town council. I think you have to request the, that an request election that. be put on the ballot through the town council, mm -hmm. and then they would, you would have the, the ballot vote. Mm -hmm. So really my request is if everyone is in agreement of, um, to move forward <coughs> with asking town council to research what it would take to introduce this sort of a change to Scarborough. I'm in favor of that um, for the reasons that you stated. I think the one thing that we, really the only drawback I can think of is turnout. 
Yeah. Usually in November, there's a higher turnout. In June, it's lower. What is the impact of that? So that's some of the information that I'd like to know, mm -hmm. but otherwise, I'm broadly supportive of going through that research. Um, the other piece that the town charter can change um, or can be changed by town council is what we vote on when we go to budget. Right now, the only piece that people vote on is the school budget. There can be a modification um, to have it be a full town budget that goes to vote. Um, it may help with some of the communication pieces. We have been a our budget has come into question many times um, for items that may not be specific to the schools um, because it is the only thing that people can speak to. And that is something that we also can ask them to look at. That is part of the research again that Dylan went through of when things can be brought forward. So mm -hmm. that's another option of asking town council to look at what would that be, what would that mean. There's no guarantee to it. This is really just our asking them to do these items on our <coughs> So I would support that. Yeah, in that spirit of asking town council to do the due diligence on this for us, and absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume probably moving forward that you'll have way more information about how this is all working, April. Looking forward to it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Nothing like saying, hey, how about this, and <laughs> add some presents. Um, and while we are talking, um, April this week went to the elected official open house. My understanding is, and I can't think back to the last time it was actually held, but it, there was an open forum um, where <coughs> our state legislatures, our town council, and our school board members would get, to, get together on a Saturday and have an open house here at town hall. People could come and it was open forum, they could ask questions, they could share their feedback, and that has been re reintroduced. It is the first Saturday of every month. It's from 10 to two. And April, if you don't mind giving an update of how the meeting went. Sure, so I attended this first um, open office hours on this past Saturday. <coughs> we had 10 um, representatives from the community, constituents from the community um, join us. The format is still unclear, and, it, and it's unclear to the elected officials. It was, it was unclear to the constituents, I think, um, whether it would be better to have more of a roundtable discussion um, or whether it was better to kind of sit as a panel and have people kind of make their statement or bring their concerns to us and then be able to leave, um, whereas we ended up doing more of a roundtable given the number of people that were there. And um, so there's definitely some... Um, logistics that will still be um, playing out as we do this more frequently. Um, it's my understanding that it certainly is um, the legislative's office hours and that they extended the courtesy of our attendance there. Um, so this was not uh, constituents bringing issues to me per se as a school board representative. This was people bringing legislative issues to their state representatives. But I will say I found it tremendously valuable to have representation from the school board there because two-thirds of the um, <coughs> material that was brought before the state mm -hmm. legislators was about education. Yeah. Um, the bills that were brought forward, uh, the things that people had questions about, education, education, it, it was a theme for the entire morning. And so I think it's really important to have a school board member attend so that we have our pulse, you know, we have our finger on the pulse of what is important to the community at the state level, and also it kind of gives us a, a way to gauge um, what's coming at us, you know, what's coming down the pike in terms of, um, you know, are there controversial bills that are about to be presented that the community would like for us to hear their input on, um, and so I found it really valuable to be there, and I would certainly encourage us as a board to create some kind of calendar or something so that we have a representative there. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Sean. Um, all right, board self-appraisal, it's that time of the year where um, we need to set up a time to reflect how are we doing, um, create kind of a baseline from where we are halfway through our 
our year together, um, and then <coughs> start working towards the goals. And it actually fits in really well, um, given the fact that we have a retreat coming up. So I'll be sending out the questions no later than Monday. I'm gonna try to get it out tomorrow if I can get the coding for something else to go through right. I'll be able to spend a little time getting that prepared and sent out to everyone. Looking for responses to come back by the 22nd. Um, that'll give me enough time to assimilate the information and have it ready to share on Saturday, March 9th at 10 o'clock. It will be an open um, meeting for the public if they wish to attend, but it will be a board mm -hmm. retreat where we'll be able to go through what the self-appraisal was, and that's a great foundation for building those goals and our norms because then we will have something to benchmark against. We'll have areas that we know that we want to improve upon, and then when we do a final or another assessment, we can see how have we grown from that, and that will give us another <coughs> opportunity to adjust those goals or enhance them as we have grown together. Um, for the board retreat, Ann Chapman will be facilitating the session. The location is still be, to be named. Um, we have an idea, but I'm still trying to see if there's a more comfortable location that we can meet in. So more to come with that because we've got a little bit of time. Um, and I've talked a lot, so I'm gonna leave it at that. That was... Can I ask a question? Yeah. Of course. Um, so about the survey questions, um, where did you get the questions and can we contribute or add or modify? Um, it is the one that I have is the one that we had agreed to in policy last year. So it was the same assessment that we had done previously. Okay. Um, that said, if as a board we find that those aren't covering what we want, I believe that in policy we can come back and create a different appraisal tool for future assessments. Um, the only downside to modifying it again is we may not be able to tell if we've grown because the data may be different. Um, is there any way to share it before it becomes absolutely. final mm -hmm. so that we can sort of just take, I mean to me that's really important because it's our self appraisal so I want to make okay. sure that we all agree on, on what's important to be discussing and, and monitoring. So. Um, I think it's important that we all sort of have a look at it. I don't disagree with that. And just to add to that, a little historical context, the tool that was selected is the um, same tool that another school district in Maine uses, RSU 21, and they presented at the school board conference back in 2016, I believe, um, or 2017, their use of this tool and how they've been using it, and then Hillary and Leanne had the chance to hear them speak directly about it. And it really is based on um, effective board standards. And so it's not you rating yourselves as individuals, it's you rating yourselves as a collective. Mm -hmm. And each um, section of the rubric is aligned to those uh, standards for effective school boards. Okay, thank you. I don't know if there's anything about this <coughs> when we had used it. Is that a just keep it as <laughs> Next. Wait, wait till we get to the calendar. She's got a list. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, committee reports. Uh, so, as you saw tonight, we gave out our spotlight award, our spotlight award to Mary Record, um, which means that nominations are open for the next award. I do want to note, no pressure, but we haven't received any nominations from the middle school. I see you guys back there. So just, <laughs> just I'm just saying. Like, um, so we will send out a, um, a notification to staff about our winner for this month, and it'll have a link in there for, um, for any further nominations. Um, the other thing that we um, we t we did a longish meeting and communications <coughs> to <clears throat> discuss the budget communications timeline. Um, Luckily, we have, so um, the other two members, Sarah and April of Communications, are also on finance, which is really helpful because it allows us to, um, it allows the crossover that we need to be able to find out um, from, directly from members, like what is it that we need to communicate and when does that need to happen? So we've been working on 
what kinds of things we're going to do and when those will occur working backwards from the referendum date in June. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we are having our very first joint communications meeting um, in conjunction with the Town Council Communications Committee. Um, that's on February 11th, <coughs> Monday, Monday um, from 4 to 5.15. Uh, and we're going to be talking there a little bit about um, just any ideas that any of our members have about any joint ventures that we want to do. And, and the other thing that we're going to be talking about is um, the logistics of having um, kind of a similar thing to what we were talking about before, open office hours, but um, with community members um, with for the local elected officials. Can you flip to the next one? Um, I also <coughs> wanted to mention uh, again that, oh shoot. <laughs> I can change that, actually, can we change? Okay, well anyway, I wanted to mention again that we are taking our Facebook page, the Scarborough Main <coughs> Board of Education Facebook page and merging it with the Scarborough Public um, Schools Facebook page. Uh, right now we're doing double duty posting in both places, but as of March 1st, um, it will just be the Scarborough Public Schools Facebook page. Um, and I just put up there our Facebook, it's called Scarborough Public Schools, and Twitter, obviously I didn't know what our Twitter handle was. <laughs> At the time, I made this slide, but I think it is hashtag no, at Scarborough, at Scarborough, Scarborough, Scarborough I don't know, school. at Scarborough <laughs> ME School. I'll change that before I put that up on the, uh, actually, Julie can change it right now. Thank you. And then, of course, our website at the bottom, or not at the very bottom, but in the box there, our website um, is also another place that you can go and get information about when meetings are happening and what the agendas are. And our next meeting date is February 29th. Um, 2.15 to 3.15. Is there a February 29th? What? I think so. Oh, shoot. February 29th? That's, that's not right. Good grief. Yeah. Yeah. True. 25th, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Hopefully my next slide will be a little bit more clear. Ready? Yeah, it's perfect. No, I'm done with communications. I oh, okay. <laughs> That's it. Does anyone have any questions? You couldn't fix that if it was a handout. I just want to say that. Is yeah. <laughs> that the point of learning? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, well, that's a tough act to follow. Um, so long-range facilities planning. So for those that don't know, long-range facilities planning, uh, the committee was on a little bit of a hiatus um, from the end of last year through this past year, and I'm excited that we've started meeting again uh, in the beginning of 2019. So our first meeting was actually on January 8th, uh, and it was held at Eight Corners Primary School. One of the things the committee really wants to try and do is actually hold as many of our meetings as possible on site at our schools so that in addition to having you know an official agenda that we can talk about we can actually tour and look around and actually be in the very facilities that we're discussing rather than here in town hall and so um, that's something we're really committed to so our first meeting was at eight corners um, we talked a lot about basically the site work um, that has been proposed for that. And this picture that I have up there is by no means to scale. I drew this in Microsoft Paint uh, from Google Maps. And so I just wanted to highlight two of the areas that uh, have gone in front of our planning board um, after meeting with the committee and, and other discussions that have happened with facilities for some mandatory, or I should say imminent improvements to the Eight Corner School. Uh, one is the uh, introduction of a parking lot that's labeled as a big gray blob of an A. On my picture there, um, that parking lot will be primarily probably used by staff, but the really driving piece here, and the other two members of the committee, April and Sarah, that are with me, got to experience this, is that the way Eight Corners is right now, it's, it's a very challenging time for pickup for the, for the young students. And um, hmm? and oh, and drop-off, drop off. yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> And, and so there's not really a great traffic flow there. The, the hoop that's kind of at the bottom that's hard to see because it's in the shadows is where the buses are. And then we stood there and witnessed in the rain how parents kind of pull in and turn around and kids wander across the street and some go down the side of Muzzy Road. And, and people make it work. And, and of course, children's safety is our utmost importance and, and everyone's keeping people safe. But obviously, it's not a, an optimal situation. And so um, there was the proposal to add a small parking lot there, and then with B, the little blue spot up in the corner, 
that's the additional spot for some portable classrooms that may need to be added as, as the populations of those, uh, that school and other schools increases with time. So um, I just wanted to put that up there because that was kind of the topic of one of our first uh, meetings. Uh, the plan was fleshed out a little more in much more detail than I've drawn here on the 23rd, which was our second meeting. Um, and I also wanted to take a moment before moving on to talk a little bit about enrollment, which was the other big topic that we've been discussing, to just mention that our special services um, here in the town deserve a round of applause. And I wanted to take a moment to just say that when we toured that school, and I'll be completely forthright and say I have not been inside of an elementary school in Scarborough in 31 years. And it was that school, because I graduated from there in 1987. And I, yes, I looked that up. Um, and it amazes me the way that our staff and our, our teaching staff and our administrative staff and our special services staff in particular have retrofitted that space to serve the students in a way that that building was never designed to do, certainly not back in the 60s when it was built. So um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that because it's amazing what they're doing with that space. Um, so taking a look at our enrollment projections. Um, we, Rebecca talked at, at, in great detail about this, and I, and I won't rehash her entire presentation, but I will present this small table that we looked at um, that I assembled from that data uh, for our committee meeting, which is basically just highlighting by phase level what we're looking at five to ten years out based on the projection models that Rebecca put together for us. And, and Julie highlighted earlier that there were six different models. Rebecca's nothing if not thorough. Mm -hmm. Six different models that were presented, and actually her expert opinion um, and, and actually the opinion of others that I've spoken with is that the best fit model with a multifamily factor included, the higher multifamily factor is probably <coughs> the most recommended, so that's what I went with for this particular table to sympathize things, uh, simplify things a little bit. <coughs> and so what you see here, and Rebecca talked about it in, in her presentation as the bubble and the movement of the bubble, is that in the first five years, most of our growth, in fact, the vast majority of our growth is with the younger um, the younger kids at the younger phase levels. And the Wentworth School, because of its newness and its flexibility, is not the huge concern, even though it's the largest number there under the deltas in five years. But uh, the K2 schools are, are of an imminent concern uh, for our district. And um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how enrollment has dipped in recent years and we're forecasting it. It has been forecasted to grow, as we saw earlier. It's actually grown a little more than the forecast said it was going to. Um, the future forecasts continue that trend and, and really our concern is is that we, we can't dial back time to the way we used our schools 10 years ago and so as a committee we're thinking about the differentiation that's happening in our classrooms you saw it in Monique's presentation the type of services excellent services that we're offering to our community and what does that mean for our schools as we move forward and like I said the committee is realizing through the data that the first place we're gonna have to pay really close attention is in the K2 arena Ten years out, that shift and that bubble moves a little bit. You'll see the growth continues in the young, in the young uh, grades, but really we start to really start to get pressure at the middle school. And so ten years out, that's a concern for us thinking, and we know that our middle school capacity um, has been exceeded for some time, and we're, we have a lot of portables in place there that are perfectly wonderful educational environments but are never meant to be a permanent solution. So um, these are conversations that this committee is starting. They are big conversations. They're conversations that take a lot of time. Uh, and I also want to just kind of wrap up by saying they're emotional conversations. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the emotion behind our K2 schools. Um, I think pe most people in this room, or probably a lot of you, have read the master plan from 2017 that proposed a very objective and very data-driven assessment of our schools and what is probably the more economical solution for our town. But that's not the only factor on the table here. Uh, there's emotion, there's tradition. Uh, I mentioned earlier I graduated from Eight Corners. I live a stone's throw from Pleasant Hill, so I'd be lying if I said it was easy for me to compartmentalize my own personal attachment to the traditions uh, of our schools here in town. But these are conversations that this committee is going to continue to have uh, and continue to have openly. Our meetings are public, and the last thing I put up here is that our next meeting is Monday, February 25th at 4 p.m., and it will be held at Scarborough Middle School, which, as I said, is one of our topics coming down the road. Not the new middle school. I've not the new middle school. I, I will never say, say that. that again. <laughs> I promise Joe, I will never say that again. Can I, can I ask a quick question before we move on to curriculum? Um, was the site plan presented to the planning board on Monday night? It was. 
and I talked with Todd, and Todd said it was received very well. There were some questions about dra uh, drainage runoff um, that he believes were satisfied to the planning board's satisfaction. Okay, so thank you. I, I have a question, um, just because I have to do drop off and pick up at Eight Corners. Um, is there any plan to address the fact that you can't go into any into the parking lot and get back out? I mean, there's no way to turn around or get out of the parking lot. We actually, it's we kinda, it's, yeah. Which is a big deal, because there's kids walking back and forth and a lot yeah. of people doing 15 point turns to try and get out of the. And, and it's a challenge because we actually asked Todd about this and the planners when they came. And, and if you look on the far right margin of this picture, you see, uh, on this picture, you would yeah. think, well, why can't we just make that kind of a turnaround yeah, and have it come back out? Yeah. And it's actually a drainage area, too. And it's a wetland area. So there actually isn't enough space there for, for a pass-through. It was one of the questions <laughs> that the committee brought up. So um, <coughs> thank you for bringing it up here. And I wish we could do that. But the topography of the spot won't let us. I think the goal is, or the hope is that um, we're not going to change this drop-off pickup right. cycle. So this will continue to be a two-way in and out. And this mm -hmm. will continue to be a one-way out. But by alleviating all the staff cars mm -hmm. here, parents yes. will actually be able to find parking spots where now they're kind of clustering because there are no parking spots yeah. where mm -hmm. you'll be able to pull into a spot and pull out of a spot um, right. in a way that you're not able to now because staff will be parking back here. Mm -hmm. And Sorry. it should open up about 32 or 4 spots yeah. mm -hmm. in, the, in the current parking lot. To answer your question, Hillary, they w they did look at all kinds of different models for weight. You know, they talked about the entryway there. They talked about whether they could expand that and make that into a U yeah. and, and move the sidewalk. And yeah. so they did look at a variety of different models to see if there was a way to get a parent drop-off lane in there, and there's just not enough room. And there will be new entrances here for staff. They'll enter in through the gym and a sidewalk that runs along here. And there's some additional work that would happen over here to the sidewalk that's not shown here. But. Okay. Any other questions? Curriculum. Um, so curriculum is uh, similar to long-range planning. It's been dormant for quite some time. Um, actually, longer probably than long-range planning. Um, but we've started it back up again. We had our first meeting on um, January 22nd. Um, the, I just wanted to remind everyone the committee consists of um, me, Amy, Nick, and then Monique, obviously, <coughs> our director of curriculum, and Julie. Um, Joanne, were you at that meeting? No. OK, no, not Joanne. Um, <laughs> I took myself off. Sorry. Um, so uh, what we talked about really were the expectations and responsibilities of what um, we would be doing as a part of that committee. Um, and we got a really neat um, pe sneak peek, I guess, into the um, work that the staff has been doing um, and the instructional coaches and Monique has been doing on the curriculum guide, um, which is this pretty amazing document that they have been building up over time. Um, it is due to be public at some, I, I'm not sure when, but um, it will be a really great resource for parents to. Did you want to show some of these? Or? No, it's, I mean, we can if you want. Um, just to be able to get, um, get some insight and visibility into what our kids are learning. And um, one of the really cool things, I, this is hard to see, but um, it's really kind of, uh, mm, it, it starts out very broad um, and, it, and it goes down um, the deeper you get into each of the subjects um, or each of the grade levels or however you want to look at it, the more specific it gets and it actually goes right down to at the very tip of the triangle actual like individual lesson plans for some of the units of curriculum that, um, that are there. The other thing is, it's hard to see on this, but um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can <laughs> access the information. You can do it by um, grade level, which is the kind of the first one, um, which is like subject matter by grade level. There's also like a calendar that shows like if you were to go into second grade, I think I went into second grade for this one, did I? Um, you, you, if you're to go into second grade, um, it shows for ELA, these were the units of study for that um, grade level, and 
and it actually gives a little calendar and shows you when they are being a comp, you know, what at what time of year they're doing those studies. Um, and then you can even further click on each of those units and get to the very last picture, which is um, an over an overview of the unit of study, and then you can go even further and get to some individual lesson plans. So I think really we were all really impressed by what is what the work that's being done to, to get this document up and running, um, and we're really looking forward to being able to help share that with our community. And it's gonna be it's gonna be an amazing resource. So I just wanted to um, <coughs> um, get that information out there. And we are going to be meeting on the first second Tuesday of every month. But any, at any rate, the next meeting is February twelfth from four to five p.m. Thank you. Did I get that right, Lily? <laughs> uh, policy's been very busy. We've been meeting a lot recently. Um, and one of the big pieces that we did this past week that is really exciting was really creating the foundation for how we move forward. Um, and the agreement was that policy BG <laughs> is the foundation for all the work. It was actually too large of a paragraph to post on here, and I didn't want to go over one slide. Um, but that first paragraph really is the baseline for everything that we will do. Um, but then we looked at goals and a philosophy. Um, one of our goals is to remove policies which are not required or recommended. And part of the reason for that is it is a best practice to go through all of your policies every year to make sure that you're up to date, that you're staying current. And we have so many that we're not. Um, we have policies that we haven't reviewed in a decade because there's so many and so many other things are happening. Um, so we really want to get that under control um, so that we can make sure that we are on time with everything. Um, we really want to prioritize safety policies for review or inclusion. Um, I can't stress safety enough um, when it comes to the children and our buildings and our staff. Um, developing a user-friendly website of policies that are in flight and on deck so that the public knows what we're working on. We want to be, it, for, we want people to be able to see where we are with this. So you'd have an opportunity to see, here are the changes that we're looking at. Um, here is the policy that we're working through tonight. Um, as an example, we're modifying ABC and it has been completely rewritten. It's inefficient for people to hear two pages of a policy <coughs> read from a table it's easier to have seen it in advance and have an understanding of where we're going with this. Um, the philosophy, just said it, policy perme permeates and dominates all aspects of our operations, um, making sure that we're providing guidance for our building leadership and district leadership, as well as future board members, um, making sure that there's you know, stability and continuity in knowledge and understanding and documentation. Um, Again, having a foundation for the governance, and then making sure that we're exercising our statutory authority and responsibilities. Anything you guys want to add as I talked so much? No, I, I think that um, the, the point about so many policies that are neither recommended or <coughs> required is, I think, an important one in terms of how many policies we need to look at moving forward. I mean, there's 36 policies that are neither required or recommended that we have on the books. So that, I think, in part makes the work of updating policies even more daunting because there's so many that we don't necessarily need to have at all. Yeah. Um, that said, I think we'll see in the next couple of months a lot of policies that we'll be recommending to have removed. Alicia, anything you want to add? No, I mean, it. it you know, it's somewhat disconcerting to see so many policies that haven't been reviewed in so many years, and it's a huge task, and, um, you know, I'm happy to, to go about it um, and have those discussions, and, and my hope is that after that work is done that we can um, really agree on what's important to have and, and keep those updated. Um, and keeping in line with all of the other committee reports, our next meeting is Monday, February 25th, which is a very popular day, um, at 4.30 here in Central Office. And again, it is open to the public. <coughs> All right.
right. Um, hopefully you guys can read that. Um, so as part of the, the <coughs> journey with the budget committee, um, I've been learning a lot of sort of how the budget cycle works. Um, some of it I knew, most of it I did not. Um, and through conversations with other board members and community members, I also realized that I think there, there is a lot of still unknown about what the process looks like. Um, it's not sort of Kate and Julie sitting behind a curtain uh, working on Excel spreadsheets all year. It's a very iterative, iterative um, and collaborative process. And also it happens pretty much throughout the majority of the year. I think there's about three or four months where Kate isn't focused on the budget. Um, so I wanted to, I mean, this isn't the most, uh, the best graphic ever, but it's not, the cycle is to demonstrate that it's not a linear process. It is cyclical and, and iterative, and, and it does start uh, really at, at like end of November, early December. Um, sorry, I'm going back to you. The, the, yeah, thanks, Julie. The, the sort of the beginning of the cycle is the top right hand corner. So if you follow it clockwise um, with a staff reflection, sort of our return on investment session. And that's when the school leaders will go and sort of look at what did we ask for last year in terms of investment? Um, and was that effective? Did it work? Uh, do we want to do it again? Um, following that, something that was new this year, um, and April and I sat in on some of the sessions, were the staff outreach sessions that Julie and Kate did at all of the uh, schools. Um, we heard formally, but also anecdotally, that they were incredibly well received. Um, so the format was informal. It's for the teachers to show up during lunch sessions, teachers, staff, admin, um, and just share feedback. So where they think the gaps are, again, what they think is working really well. Um, and from that, Julie and Kate um, have been able to pull out some themes. So there are some things that were pretty consistent across all the schools. Um, some of the things were different. Um, but all of that, again, uh, feeds into to what the budget um, will look like. Uh, so that progresses um, back through, I think, December and happening now um, are the individual department meetings where the department heads um, will again go to Kate and Julie and present their, their initial budget requests. Um, they should follow this, the themes that you're seeing from the, the um, <coughs> previous sessions as well. Um, and, and also happening right now, and I, I, or actually happened in January, I think there's, I don't think there's any more now, we're the listen to learn sessions. So this is when you really get that first um, sort of focused community engagement opportunity where um, both, both at the school and at the town level, so these are sessions that were held with Julie and Tom where anybody in the town can come and give feedback. Again, what's working, what's not working, what they value, um, and what maybe we're, uh, we spend too much money on at times. Um, and then finally, uh, I shouldn't really say finally, but finally on this, this presentation is when uh, we, the, as a joint committee between us and the town council, we sort of get the first look at what the budget is and can question it um, and get all that information before it goes to the board for the first read. So it's important to note that it doesn't end here. Um, this really just brings us up into when the first reading is. Um, after that first reading, <coughs> there's a whole nother round of sort of community engagement and communication until we go to the second reading, which is which is ultimately the vote in June. Uh, next slide. Unless there are any questions. Cool. Um, I'm gonna, April is actually going to give an update on the Budget Advisory Committee. Um, sure. So as a member of the Finance Committee, several weeks ago, I volunteered to take on a pet project um, because I don't have enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> and this is great timing for doing this, um, but it's actually the worst timing in the world. Um, but it was important to several other members of the board, um, and I was getting feedback um, from people in the community. And so we are in the very <coughs> preliminary initial stages of getting this discussion started. Um, but I did think it was important um, to, at, at the very least, start the discussion. And so what I decided to do was um, cast a broad net, <coughs> but a very small one, um, out to people that I know personally uh, in the community that I know land on all sides of the budget. Um, and so I emailed a list of five or six questions um, to each of these people. 
and I invited them to have coffee. Um, and I used the same set of guiding questions to uh, inform the conversations at each one of these um, coffee dates. Um, I will say, as, as an update, um, all seven people that I emailed um, graciously accepted my invitation. Um, and so for that, I'm very appreciative. And we are, I haven't presented or really talked through um, some of the themes um, that emerge from those conversations at the committee level. And so I would like to do that before we say much on uh, in detail to the board. Um, but I do want to also open up the opportunity if there's anyone else who would like to discuss a budget advisory committee, um, feel free to email myself or Sarah or newly minted Alicia. Um, and we would be happy to uh, send you the questions and, and set up a coffee date. Thanks, April. Uh, and then just finally, the Q2 financials will be posted online, I think, Monday. Um, and then we have our first joint finance uh, meeting with town council on this coming Monday at 5.30, right after the communications joint meeting. Also popular. Very popular. Mm -hmm. That's it. All right, new business, 10.0. Um, I'm gonna, bun I'd like to bundle 10.1, 10.2, which are the meeting minutes for December 20th, the workshop and the business meeting into one motion. If somebody would like to make that. So moved. Second. Are there any questions or concerns with the minutes as written? For ready to vote, <coughs> all those in favor? Seven plus two. <coughs> Okay, 10.3 is the first reading of policy ABC, tobacco and vapor producing products, possession and exposure. Um, um, hmm? As I had kind of alluded to um, in the policy review, I'm really hoping I don't have to read the two pages. <laughs> um, so, no. um, <laughs> did everybody have an opportunity to read them in advance of the meeting? Yes. Mm -hmm. And just to share for the folks at home, um, for those parents maybe of the K2, possibly um, Wentworth may not recognize how <coughs> prevalent vaping has become with our middle school and high school students. It is reaching epidemic proportions throughout the country and I don't think Scarborough is um, exempt from that. Um, so we're really trying to enhance the tobacco policy that was in place. Um, to include vapor producing products and ensuring that we are keeping our campuses um, mm -hmm. at all times tobacco and vapor free. And that's really what the whole policy is there. I believe it was posted online as well, so hopefully folks in the community had an opportunity to read it as well. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the request for our first reading. Um, there is, are some minor um, grammatical changes I had a couple of misspellings, I believe, in here, um, so we'll be going through. But we're going to be looking to bring this back for a second reading um, at March. in March. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but are there discussion from what folks had seen in the policy? Don't we have to have a motion first? Oh, yeah, we do. Thanks, Hillary. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you're making the motion to accept um, policy ADC as written? Sure. So Great. moved. Second. And now we can open for discussion. Um, I just had a question about the enforcement or the violation, I guess. Or, yeah, I guess the enforcement. Because I remember the last time that you guys were discussing this in policy, you had mentioned <coughs> that one of the problems is that um, the policy had referred to like handbooks mm -hmm. or individual schools to come up with what they would do to enforce it, and yet those schools or handbooks didn't have that information in it. So I was just wondering, because I don't see here it being addressed again, so I was just wondering how that was, um, how it played out. Um, and go ahead, and I'll show you guys can go ahead and pipe in on this. Um, there was a, dis a distinct decision to remove all of that enforcement to ensure that we were not creating the enforcement policies at the board level, mm -hmm. that it really should be held at the local level. Okay. Each phase level um, 
has their procedures in place and again it's not a one-size-fits-all um, and each one is a little bit different on how they handle things so we were bringing it back down to the local level yeah it was um that, that was super important to us I, I think that I mean obviously our policy is that we have a tobacco and vapor <coughs> free environment K through 12 um, but how that's managed we think belongs in the hands of the experts, people working day to day in the schools. So we wanted them to be able to develop what made sense at each phase level. And then obviously um, policy and handbooks don't always happen at the same time. So I think Julie said June is when usually administrators update their handbook. So if we can get this policy passed, then, then they have the policy to reference as they're making things um, match in their day to day operations. And some principals are already starting that process now. And so really what Amy said is 100% correct. We, you set policy and then we adjust our practice to align with policy. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor of the first reading? Okay. Seven and two. I would just, if I could just add, thank you for your work on this policy. I know you put in a lot of hours to make sure that it was um, not only correct in the terminology that was being used, but that it was relevant in referencing things that students are actually, that are going to have meaning to students. Because if we're talking about tobacco-free schools in today's day and age, that's not going to resonate with our students. And vaping is an epidemic. Students are vaping starting as early as middle school. Um, and it really does take a whole community support for us to combat this and educate ourselves as the adults, and, um, but also to educate our students about what they're doing to their bodies and the lifelong uh, impact that it can have. So well, thank you. That was the real difficult part was the fact that they're doing things that we've never heard of before. So thank you for sort of informing us of what's going on because, you know, some of it was mind boggling. Yeah, I would say it was definitely an eye opening experience yeah. to hear about what is happening with the students. Um, okay, 10.4, <coughs> removal of policies. Um, I'd like to do these in separate motions. Um, the first motion is a motion to remove policy JLCE, the first aid and emergency care. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, discussion. You, yeah, I was just going to oh, ask, yeah. is there a good. rationale for the rule of the There sponsor? is. Let me go back to find that. I <coughs> Great. I'm going to go back here. Is there a school health manual? Oh, there is. Yeah. Yeah. While you're searching for that, can I just make a quick statement? Absolutely. Thank so you. So for everyone here and everybody at home, and especially the people who have stood up here tonight and spoken during public comment about the importance of this, I just want to really quickly say that for those that don't know, I have an immediate family member who's involved in the health care of students in the Scarborough school system, and mm -hmm. I will probably be, I will be abstaining from the votes that have to do with these issues, and it is not because I don't think they're important. Growing up in a medical family, <coughs> I think they're of the utmost importance that we make these types of decisions but I need to abstain to avoid any perceived conflict of interest. So I just wanted to say that up front. Thank you. Did you say, Julie, I didn't hear that? Uh, Hillary said, I thought nurses were going to attend tonight, and I said, no, they came to the last policy meeting. The last they're two policy that. meetings. <laughs> I was told they'll watch it tonight. <laughs> and and Joanne, Joanne's also going to speak to I'm all of this as them. well. So, Do you want to speak first, Joanne, <clears throat> before they well, Why don't you go through that one, and I'm ready okay. for the others. All right, so for policy JLCE, and I apologize it took so long to find the document. Um, this policy is no longer needed as school staff are responsible for student safety during school or school related events. School staff act in place of parents in local parentis 
and have a legal responsibility to take reasonable steps to minimize injuries and secure medical assistance when <coughs> needed. And that was the rationale behind why they didn't need a policy. <laughs> Um, and to Julie's point, that policy was adopted in 2008, so it's a decade um, past when we have made any modifications to it. So it's, again, they're keeping up to date with that with their protocols and procedures and within their um, health manuals. So what's the rationale behind removing this instead of just changing it to um, be more updated? Part of the conversation is, one, the pop, all of these policies are not recommended or required um, for school boards to have. Second, and probably the more important, is then they are restricted to what we allow them to do. And as things change, if they need to modify it, they have to come back up to the board and they have to get it on the agenda and get that changed. And that can be a two-month process at best case. By the time the work gets done, you have your first reading and then a second reading. So we are binding them <laughs> from being able to uh, administer care the more detailed in a policy that we get. And that really was, um, to, that was the impression or the biggest piece that I took away from what Lisa was saying during that meeting. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I can add to that, Please. the um, the protocol that they follow um, related to um, first aid and emergency care is far more comprehensive than the policy JLCE. So they're, they're so doing- So is that related to JL, the, the procedure here, that's the policy and procedure, JLCER? It's different. Um, it's different, but like, like th this, this policy isn't, isn't a required policy. Right. It's not even a recommended policy. And all it basically says is that the superintendent or de designee will establish and implement procedures for handling a accidents and injuries, which are the protocols that are in place. So this basically and is just an overreach of directing me to do my job, which I'm but, and, but even the procedure um, in our policy manual is not as comprehensive as as the protocol that the nurses follow um, in terms of how they administer first aid and emergency medical care. It just seems, not to be argumentative, but it just seems that the procedure is really what's out of date, not necessarily the policy. Well, the or policy the is The procedure to, is what's holding them back as opposed to the actual policy. Well, the, the um, policy also is limiting them and because it says that you know, you, you're, they're going to provide training to appropriate staff and that you're going to expect them to do their job. And we don't need a policy to, for the nursing staff to do their job. That's their job is to take care of kids okay. in the medical. And so that's why it's, it's not a recommended or a required one because mm -hmm. it's part of their job. Well, I don't think that it limits them in doing their job. I think it just sets the expectation. <coughs> I understand what... Um, what you're, you're saying in terms of it, some of these outdated policies can be limited um, if they're not reviewed and the, the people that are trying to do their work on the ground um, are bound by policy. But in this case, I'm not sure that it's having that effect. Um, but I also am not sure that it's a policy that's necessary to have. The school has um, uh, procedures in place um, and I'm, I'm not really that concerned about it. One, I, I sort of would like to go back and discuss the history, although we've discussed it in, in some respects um, previously in previous board meetings, but um, the reason why we're here is because the school board last year, um, the policy committee, took a look at the, the, as I understand, the policies that were outdated and decided to try to clean up some of those policies and ask the school nurses to take a look at those policies and determine what um, they felt we could get rid of. Some of the language I think is confusing when we talk about what's recommended and what's required for policies. So Drummond Woodson <coughs> has provided us as, our, as the law firm representing the school system with a list of required um, policies and recommended policies. So when we use the language, well, they're not required and they're not recommended, that I think that can be somewhat ambiguous. It's 
it's not that they're not recommended, it's that they are not on the recommended list. And there's, there's a distinction, it's, it, it may seem subtle, but it, it, to me it's, it is a distinction. Um, and so that doesn't mean you can't have policies that are not on the required list or on the recommended list. It's a matter of what our goals are as a board and, and for our schools mm -hmm. and what we think is necessary for guiding the schools and for guiding the people that are doing their work and we don't want to limit them and, and make them wait for, for, I mean, I don't know when this was last reviewed, the date, uh, but you know, it was. Yeah, it has never been reviewed since, since 2008. Since 2008, so you can see why that would be a problem and it's been a problem, you know, it, it, I think it, it could be viewed as a problem in cases that are more relevant or, or have more changes. I'm, I'm not really that uncomfortable with this policy, but, um, you know, I, I do have a concern about some of the other policies. I have a question. Um, having never served on policy, being brand new to all of this, um, there's, I think there's the fear for me <coughs> is that I'm, that, that we're, I understand the, le the recommended and not, you know, I, I, I get that. Um, is there a policy, however, that does dictate the protocols that are in place? Because I think what people are concerned about, what I would be concerned about removing this would be that the protocols are not being dictated by something larger. Right, like is there something that says each school needs to review protocols on a yearly basis, any health protocols on a yearly basis, or blah, 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 something like that. So is that what you're saying? I yes. just want to, okay, so the bigger picture. Yes. Okay? So the <coughs> assistant superintendent for many, many years has worked with the school nurses. They are the experts. I have to say I'm not an expert in, mm -hmm. the, in the health field. And um, what happens is, is that, um, some of these policies limit them. So if they had a policy that said about protocol, they can't change that protocol until they come to policy. Then policy has to review it. Then it has to go to the first reading. Then it has to come back. And that's why it takes so long for a policy to change that when they have a protocol, if the needs need to be met, they um, can do that without having to go through the whole. In consultation with the school physician. Absolutely. That's why you employ a school physician as well, to assist them with Correct. That. But I think that there's some confusion because our policy has a protocol attached to it. And that was back in 2008 right. when, for instance, let's procedure, take, sorry. if a student is sent home because of an injury, the principal or designee will first contact the parent or guardian to notify them. It really is the school nurses who do that, you know, who take that on. And um, so there's a lot of language in here um, that um, doesn't follow what our, what's happening today. Back then we probably had a nurse, uh, we didn't have a nurse in every um, large building, you know. A lot of them went between, I know back then, middle school and Wentworth they had. so. So then for me, that begs the question, why not modify that document as opposed to getting rid of it? Well, I, so I, can, I just, can I just ask a clarifying question? Please. I understand that, that the policy itself is out of date, and I, and I don't like the idea of putting our nurses in the position of having to choose to give our students the highest quality care or be in violation of our policies. Like that's, that's not a fair position to put our nurses in. And I think the bigger issue is that there's a document attached to our, and actually this doesn't really have to do with first aid, this has more to do with allergies, but there are many, many policies that have documents attached to them, they're labeled with an R, and they're a procedure for a policy. And the procedure <coughs> in these cases are, are are much longer and more detailed than the policy. And I, I just wanna ask a clarifying question because I'm, I'm under the assumption that each school has their own protocol of what to do in this first aid situation and, a, and the food allergies and the diabetes and that that 
is separate from this protocol that is is like coming down from the board. Is that not correct? That I'm going to go on the limb and say no, that is not correct. There so if is we remove this protocol protocol there are procedure. procedure there are no protocols at no, the they no they have, have they have right it. that's what i'm asking so are separate, there not separate ones at each school there is a protocol that covers all phase levels that all nurses have worked on together okay. our nurses <coughs> meet, our, our nurses meet every two weeks mm -hmm. and um they are very dedicated very in tune to what the needs of the kids are mm -hmm. and um, when they went through the review of this they have procedures in place where they all put, work together to put those procedures in place mm -hmm. and really talk <coughs> and, and collaborate quite well together. And, and I guess the other clarifying question, and I think this is what April was trying to get to, is, is, there, any is there any regulation to, um, to, to maintaining and updating this document, the, the protocol? Yes. Because like one of our one of the community members had said, well, what happens in five years when all the nurses turn yes. over? So basically, no. like, is there something? I mean, I I understand that like yeah. this is going to stay, but is there Do any? Is, am I making is my question? You, you that are, was, but I, that I was my question, Hillary. I, you you did a much better job bringing that back, this making does, sure that this document is maintained. And you, updated which policy regularly. are you talking about, Hillary? Because I'm I mean, not we're, talking about a policy. I'm talking I'm, about the school. The, but which subject which, subject which subject matter are you talking? Are you talking just, talk, just in general? In but, general. But you're oh. actually you should be discussing mm -hmm. JLCE. Right. But there's no protocol for the schools don't have. Protocols. Well, so we have an emergency yes, management system. Right. Right. So, for instance, if um, they follow the same procedures with our safety plans that are each school, they all have yeah. the same hold in place, lockdown. If there's a health a health issue, oh, wow. those things are followed. Okay, and so school. And there's some sort of protocol for first aid, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, can, what what are the? Where am I can I speak on on this for a second? Um, so there. I don't know if I got this from the nurses at the protocol, <clears throat> excuse me, at the policy meeting or if this was handed out tonight, but this is the school system's first aid and emergency protocols. Mm -hmm. Our policy on first aid and emergencies, we have a policy and then we have a procedure. Right. Okay, so <clears throat> your question I think is, if we get rid of the first aid and emergency policy and procedure, what, how, how would this be binding on any school employee yes. and is there some sort of oversight on when there's a change and how, do the, how does the public access this document? Those are my concerns as well um, and I've stated them in policy committee. So um, we did discuss that. Uh, <coughs> I would feel comfortable if we had a general policy I'll just say, even though we're not talking about it, I'm not going to support the removal of the allergy policy. But but we're only talking about. I, I understand that, right but I'm just going to go off, break the rule because. Um, but but, I think that if we're going to remove these policies, it might be beneficial to have a policy that says, the school protocols, regarding health, matters, um, are going to be contained on the website and they're going to be reviewed annually by the nurses and they're going to be provided to the. To the schools, you know, to the students, either by reference through the handbook or, or something like that. I think that that would make sense. I think that would take care of your concern and my concern, um, and that's something that I would feel comfortable with. I, I think that makes a lot of sense too. I I also think, however, that our nurses are professionals, and our nurses take an oath to to care for the students in the school. I mean, that that's what they do. Our state laws protect, I mean, they, our state laws mandate that nurses will and implement licensed. first aid to students who need it in the schools. Right. Right, Joanne. The yeah. license They're, is very different than um, other licenses of people who work in schools, and they um, really hold to, to that. And they would, for instance, a, student, a new student comes to school, the first thing they would do if they had an allergy was to take out the protocol and review that with the parent to make sure mm -hmm. that that child's plan because what has happened over the years is that more kids have allergies and are specific and um, they look at each individual child and what their needs are. But we're not talking about allergies. I know. Yeah, but these, 
I, I agree. They're, they're licensed. They, they take an oath. They provide great care to our kids. But I've got to ask, why not? Why not say, we're going to provide the, the we're going to leave it. We're going to, I mean, I think it's the best of both worlds. We're going to give the nurses the ability to draft their protocols. The public's going to know where they are. We're going to have a, a expectation for, for the administration to ensure that the nurses are reviewing it annually. And I, I think that that takes care of everybody's concern. So I guess, Joe, that was my question. Like, is there something in place that allows for school protocols, whether they're health or safety or first aid or whatever, to be reviewed? Yes. And if so, when when are they reviewed and, and what does that fall under? Um, we review all of these protocols before the school year begins. Okay. So, and throughout the year, if there's any adjustments that need to happen, because these protocols would be reviewed with staff who need right. to know about students that they have in their classrooms. Another thing and, then, and, and then at various points throughout the year as needed. If a situation right. comes up or like this is different or unique, let's look at the protocol. Does it address it? Does it not? Right. Um, or if there's a, you know, an unfortunate situation where a student mm -hmm. is injured or a student has to be transported, speaking specifically to first aid, then we always debrief and say what worked well about our protocol, right. mm -hmm. what do we need to improve. Um, was the communication the way we expect it to be? And so that's an ongoing process that <laughs> happens for us um, anytime there's a first aid or medical emergency. Absolutely. And, and I understand the value of allowing the nurses to, be, to have this be a living, breathing document, right? I mean, they, you, you don't want to put them in the position of having to come to the board and wait months to change a protocol that they know is in the best interest of the students they're serving. I would be very, I would be very comfortable removing these policies if I knew that there was some sort of um, requirement for them to be reviewed. I know that they review them every year, and I know that they probably review them far more often than that. But I, mean, I guess my question is: is there, is there something that is requiring that? So that if it didn't happen, there would be some recourse. Well, I would say that's our direct supervision of staff. Right. I mean, we, we are responsible for evaluating staff every year. Um, it's our responsibility to ensure that they're using current relevant protocols. Um, principals are involved in that. Joanne works directly <laughs> with them along with the, the school. Well, then let me ask it to you this way. If, if we were to consider a general medical policy that says the the you know, first aid and emergency protocols will be um, as dictated by the, the school's pr protocols. Um, those will be reviewed annually. What would be wrong with that? What would be the downside? Nothing. I think you have laws that require that. I understand that, and I understand that they're licensed, and I understand that there's a standard of care, and like I said in policy, but we've all been to different doctors, and we've seen, and I'm not disparaging any of the current nursing staff in this statement, but I mean, I don't know what's going to happen next year or the year after, but we've all been to different doctors and we've seen different levels of care. And so, so yes, I understand <coughs> that there are protections in place, mm -hmm. obviously, but, but what's the downside in, in setting that expectation as a baseline? It, it seems to me that it meets the needs of the nurses and it also takes care of the concerns that the public has and, and that the board has. So are you suggesting one policy that would be an umbrella to say that the, that the health staff will review protocols <coughs> on an annual basis? I wouldn't limit it to the health staff. Why wouldn't you just review all? I mean, don't you review all your protocols on a mm -hmm. regular basis? We do, That's, but, right. yeah. I'm, but we're talking health staff. Yeah. But, that, yeah, is I mean, a, but that is like our general um, review has to happen before the school year opens because of all new staff that we have coming on, then the, the staff that's coming back, principals review <coughs> procedures and, policy, and um, protocols in the schools, the nurses do trainings to all the different groups in the schools. I, I'd feel comfortable with that, Joanne, on everything but the allergy policy. So I would never, I would never, ever, it's unfortunate that I think that this conversation um, is centered around um, an emotional topic where I would never want to present the, even the, I don't, I don't even know what the words are, um, that I'm calling into question the professionalism or the 
you know, abilities of our nursing staff. This has absolutely nothing to do with that. I understand they took an oath. Um, we also took an oath. Our job is to set good policy. And so what I want to be very clear about before I vote to remove a policy is, is there some kind of mechanism in place to make sure that the protocols um, are being followed? And I understand that it's, in theory, it's good practice. And of course, we're doing that you know, all along the way. But to Alicia's point, I think setting that expectation and putting that in policy and making that a policy, I, I don't see the downside of that. Can I ask a white elephant question? Of course. Would it be easier if I stepped out of the room for this? No. No. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay. I am. Uh, no. I, I, hear what pe I hear what people are saying about that. I also feel that in part we're talking about semantics. I mean, people seem to have put this weight on policy that, oh, there's a policy, so nothing will ever go wrong because there's a policy. The, the state mandates how we should care for our kids and how should we, should, we should medically take care of them. The state mandates that we need to provide protections for individuals with allergies. Nurses take an oath that's part of their, it's, it's part of what they do. They're, they're not going to, I mean, I get that there's, you know, sometimes there's a standard of care that's maybe less than, but Scarborough has been the, they've, they've been the leaders in this, always, and that's going to continue. I, I feel like the more important thing is that <coughs> those protocols are public and accessible. Um, whether it's called a policy or a protocol or a regulation or a procedure, the important part is that it is out there for the public to see that this is how the Scarborough School Department is going to take care of, of the students in the school in terms of medical needs. I agree with you. I think, it, I think part of it is clearly semantics. I think I agree also that an important and significant piece of this is how do we make sure that the protocols are public? The nurses have agreed that if these policies are removed that they'll make the protocols public, mm -hmm. but a policy, a general policy would ensure that that happens. Um, it would require the administration to make sure that that happens. And again, I'm not suggesting anybody currently wouldn't do that, but what I'm saying is that we set an expectation, and that's our job, is to set that expectation. Mm -hmm. Additionally, you know, although the nurses have a standard of care, the administration might not know, necessarily know what that is. And so, again, part of our job is to ensure that the administration is supervising the nursing staff to make sure that things are run well. And that expectation will be set that the, that the protocols are reviewed annually. The administration will have the opportunity to review those protocols and ensure that the nursing staff continues to provide excellent care for our students. And I don't see anything wrong with that. And, and quite frankly, if, if it's a one-line policy that never has to be reviewed again and it, and it sets a good expectation for administration and for nursing staff, I don't see why we wouldn't do that. Can I, can I just make one more comment, and, and if it's okay, can I talk about <laughs> allergy, even though we're supposed to be only talking can, about JLCE? Well, what we really need to stay with JLCE, also in the fact of looking at the time, we need to table this motion in order to take a vote to continue past 930, because this conversation, this is just the first one, and we've got four more to go, and it's going to be the same conversation to be had. Okay, and is it worthwhile to just vote on that first aid one and get the allergy one? Um, Okay, I'm just saying. Well, no, you could you could move the question. You could make an you could make a friendly amendment to the motion that was on the table, or we can table this motion in order to move forward with voting or to extend the time, vote. or we can vote. But I don't think we're at a position to vote because there's still a lot of conversation to be had. I don't have a problem with the first aid one, personally. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and vote um, before. I'll hold my comments. Never mind. Um, all right. Well, before we, I mean, I guess I wasn't done discussing it. Okay, then let's table it. Okay. We can pull it right off the table. Yeah. yeah. 
All right, the motion is to table. The vote is to table the motion that was on. All those in favor? Second. Oh, second. <laughs> second. Yeah. Thank you. All right, six, one abstention, and two. All right, I'm making a motion to extend to 10 o'clock so that we can finish the new business for tonight. So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? All right, seven and two. Okay. Now, can I have a motion to pull back from the table um, the topic of JLCE? So moved. Second. Fantastic. All those in favor? Six and a set one abstention and two. All right. Now we can continue talking. Okay. So, so Hillary, you said that you wouldn't be opposed to the removal of the first aid um, in emergency protocol. I, well, I think the, the, and part of the reason is that the emergency protocol, I don't, it's on my computer. I, I mean, I, I, Joanne, I, Joanne made a good point. It's, it, it's the law, I mean, it's redundant and, and I, and the protocol part of it, procedure part of it is far less um, detailed than the other policies that we're looking at. But the protocols are are more detailed. I could I could show you a copy of mine. And and if we do what you suggested, then right. we can um, ensure that those are reviewed annually. Yes. Ensure that they are posted publicly. Ensure that they're accessible to the public. They they will be if you've been on the uh, nurses website, which is under health services. They will be posting, they have a lot posted, but they will also be posting these protocols. At, um, and I mentioned that earlier, Joanne, but what I'm saying is there's nothing to ensure that that happens. And I think it's best practice to have a policy that sets an expectation for administration that, that that's what's going to happen. And, um, and again, I, I don't understand the downside. But the downside is I heard it earlier. The reason why we wanted to remove all of these excessive policies is because they were cumbersome, um, that they needed constant review, and that we were removing the ability for nurses to um, act in the field. This suggestion takes care of all of your concerns, and it, it, and it provides the protection that others are seeking. And, and again, we're only talking about this first aid and emergency care, so, so why wouldn't we do that? I, understand, I hear what you're saying. I don't disagree with it, but that is not what the motion is. The motion is to remove a policy. That is a completely different discussion to create a new policy and one that belongs in the policy committee to address. Um, <laughs> I, I do agree that there is nothing wrong with having an umbrella um, across the board that covers many things. Well, then I guess I wouldn't want to remove it until that policy existed. Yeah, uh, fundamentally, I just I feel like if I feel like the removal of a policy that is not backed up by a larger umbrella policy um, doesn't feel right, then to me, this is putting the cart ahead of the horse. I'm voting, the, the vote is to remove a policy, um, and there's, there's nothing um, in its place. I understand Amy's point, though. This, there is something there. Mm -hmm. It's just semantics. What do you call it? Is it a policy? Mm -hmm. Is it a procedure? If you're not, you're, if you remove this, it wouldn't remove right. any of the, the law. And mm -hmm. the law, first of all, or the <coughs> protocols that are already in place mm -hmm. at the school levels. But those could be removed tomorrow and there would be nothing ensuring that they remain. Well, actually, they couldn't, because that's Correct. the law, right? No, the protocols are not the law. But the law is... The, the protocols law. speak to the, pro the, the law, though. The, the protocols speak to the law. The protocols speak to how the law is going to be carried out in an effective way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. right now, if we remove this policy, there's nothing to ensure that those protocols, although 
I'm sure they will be currently. There's nothing to ensure that in 10 years, if we go another 10 years like we did last time, that they are reviewed annually, that they're posted publicly, and that administration is reviewing them with their staff. Joanne, did, didn't you say that the nurses review all of their protocols annually and they meet than, and maybe more than annually? More than annually. Today. I, I've been with them for 10 years and they um, constantly talk about how to provide <laughs> the best care for kids and as new things have come up, how to change what they do and they talk together so those same procedures are done at different schools. Again, all I want to say. And I get, get yes. what you're saying. Me, I just want I, you to know that. I know it, that. It's that um, you know, they do do a lot of I, I work. Under, I understand that, and nothing that I'm saying is meant to take away from that. They provided fa fabulous care for, for my children. I've, I've observed them providing fabulous care to other children. I've heard from parents, even the parents that are worried about what we're doing tonight, have nothing but great things to say, but mm -hmm. nobody can say, express a downside to that plan. <laughs> other, than, other than we want to get rid of policies to, to clean them up. Well, we can get rid of all of the other policies and we can have a one, a two-liner that never needs to be reviewed again and it takes care of your concerns and it takes care of everybody else's concerns. So why wouldn't we do that? I, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of get, getting rid of any of these policies because just to get rid of a policy. I, I, am, I am supporting what the nurses told me loud and clear in our meetings that they wanted they felt it was best practice to go this way. And I, I guess I, I trust that our administrators and our, our assistant superintendent, our superintendent are gonna do what they do in terms of managing and evaluating and, and supervising. I just think it's our job to ensure that we set the expectation. Joanne, is there a, um, a you said that they're posting the procedures and protocols on, online. They're in the process of doing so. Well, they can't do it until after but we remove our policies, policies and procedures. Because they're out of Yeah, because right. you'd have two procedures. Not in right. right. And I know we're not supposed to be bleeding over, but all of our stuff is so far out of date. It, it would take a long time to get them into any sort of an alignment. What are you referring to? Yeah. Um, so... Specifically, you have in relation to this, you this have policy. procedures and regulations in the um, policy now, and that's why these aren't posted yet because they would not. I, I understand yep. that, but in terms of being outdated and in, in providing first aid and emergency care, how? What do you mean? Again, I was saying I was bleeding over the same way that the rest of us have led our conversation. Um, if I could make a recommendation, yeah. I think you should. Just, just vote on whether to remove these or not. And yep. I think it's appropriate during discussion for you to share your a position, <laughs> um, but each person should share their position and then you should vote. And if you wanna then direct the committee to take up a new policy or to do some further work in policy, um, that would be appropriate after you take action on, the, on what has been proposed here by the policy committee. That's the cleanest way to do it, I think. Otherwise, I feel like you're going to be stuck right here mm -hmm. having this debate. We'll go on that end of the table. Oh, I thought she said we, we should just go ahead and vote. move the vote right now. Okay. Yeah. You already have the motion. In the All right. To all of them, or just no, to no, remove JLCE and JLCER. Just JLCE. Yeah. We're just doing them in separate pieces. All those in favor of removing JLCE? Four. Those opposed? Two. One abstention. And Kristen, I didn't see oh, which way you voted. Oh, yeah, Okay. So it was four, two, one abstention, and two opposed. So that passed. Okay, I'm going to try to keep this cleaner um, with the next conversation, which is JLCER, the first aid administrative procedure. Um, again, the nurse's um, reasoning for this 
Very similar to the first, this policy is no longer needed as staff are responsible for student safety during school or school related events. School staff act in place of parents in loco parentis and have a legal responsibility to take reasonable steps to minimize injuries and secure medical assistance when <coughs> needed. Um, our procedures, again, have not been reviewed since they were adopted on April 3rd, 2008. So the recommendation is um, for the nurses to remove this policy and allow their protocols to be posted publicly and to be followed. Is there a motion to remove policy JLCE-R? So moved. Second. Further discussion? I just have a, and this is gonna be the same comment for this one and allergies. It, I have a little bit of a concern voting to remove something when I haven't seen what's going to replace it, the protocol. And so that seems like a weird, mm -hmm. uh, like sort of carp for like dependency. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, the nurses shared their protocols with all of the policy committee, so I think that any one of the policy committee members could could either read or um, speak to those. I, see, I yeah. believe Alicia had the. Yeah, I have that one. I think you gave it to me. Oh, of course, they could change tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's anyone, it's a good use of anyone's <laughs> time for us to all sit through and read this now. Um, I thought you were given those prior. Not the protocol. Okay. Not and the, and the allergy things we just protocol. got today. I, this just was on the desk tonight. Is, is, so are you even allowed to have policy JLCE R if there's no policy JLCE? Wait, what? Yes or no? You can. One saying yes, one saying no. Okay. I thought they had to go together. You can, you typically don't have a procedure without a policy, but these codes that, whatever we decide to call our codes is a local decision. It could be policy XYZ if you wanted it to be. So they don't okay. have to be dependent. That's just typically how they're organized. I will say this policy in front of you, nothing about this is accurate or current. The procedure? The procedure. No. I mean, they do CPR now. They train first aid people in the building. They have accident reports that we fill out. Um, none of that was present back then. Defibrillators? Defibrillators. Yes. They've trained people on that. Narcan. Um, Narcan, they have in our schools now. Reference to calling um, emergency services to the school if necessary, and how that will happen. I, I'm, I'm in support of removing the procedure because it's outdated. What, what I'm not in support of is not supplementing the original policy with something that gives us the, okay. opportunity, the ability to um, review the <coughs> protocols in the future. Um, is there any more, any other discussion regarding the procedures? So I don't have the, some of the supporting documents. I know some of the people down there on that end of the table do. I don't. Um, I'm lost now as to which protocols are even being um, alluded to. If I'm understanding this correctly, we're voting to remove a policy. Procedure. That procedure. We're re voting to remove a procedure which is out of date and not at all accurate, which is to be replaced by a procedure that... Protocol. A, I'm sorry. <laughs> a protocol that is accurate, that has been written, that is an existing document, but oh. can't be posted because this other one is in its way. Right. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. And the reason why a procedure is better than a policy <laughs> is because it gives them much more flexibility to sort of make changes rapidly. Mm -hmm. right. Protocol. But it's there. But there's she was saying she was nodding yes to procedure. So. It's protocol. Procedure, okay. protocol. But there's protocol. nothing that requires its review. There's nothing that requires that it that the protocol be public. Um, 
and there's nothing that provides any sort of notice if it's amended. So Alicia, you're saying that currently that language does exist because that's J-L-C-E-A-R? Well, I mean, I think what's probably been in practice is that the protocols have not been consistent with the policy and the school nurses continue to provide best care for our mm -hmm, students. Of course. Um, but what I'm saying is that this protocol is probably going to still be there no matter what happens. It just there's just no mechanism for its review or for its publication, although it's going to be published. I'm wondering if there's, if there's a interim step that we may be missing, which is take all the proposed protocols and put them in some sort of draft state that says that's public so everyone can see them so that when people come <laughs> into this meeting, they're not getting them, not seeing it for the first time. And then we're being asked to vote to remove something when we don't know what's what is going to replace it. And because and I realize that they can't be official because they contradict mm -hmm. one another, um, but it seems to me that there's a an interim step that we might be missing that um, would be appropriate. And I know that uh, that's a motion itself, and we need to focus on this. But that's where I kind I'm standing right now. I agree with you. I'm I'm really frustrated that that wasn't provided to you guys. I don't, I don't know why that did that happened, and I'm, hope, I'm hoping it doesn't happen again because we're spinning our wheels, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, I, it, it shouldn't have happened, and I don't know how it did, and I and I just want to make sure that we have mechanisms in place so it never happens again. I would like to ask perhaps that, just in, in the interest of moving this forward, that we maybe withdraw the motion on the table, and bring this forward again, because if we can't get the emergency first aid done, we're not getting the, the allergy done. And Amy, I just want to amend something slightly that you said, which is, yes, it's important that we see this, but it's more important that the parents who came and expressed their concern and who have emailed us know what is replacing the policy. And so it's, it, it might, it, we have to figure out a way to make it public. Oh, so I agree with you on yeah. both on both counts. I just yeah. thought that it yeah. was posted. I know we had the uh, emergent, the uh, excuse me, the allergy, and the EpiPen copies of the protocols here tonight for folks. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that I heard that it was online as well. Um, so, so we've had this happen on a few different <laughs> subjects. Can, what's the barrier for that happening? It, it seems like it, it 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 occurs in policy. We there's so, some sort of a decision at, that 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 we need supporting documentation and then when we get to the board meetings the, the documents that we need to conduct business haven't been shared. Um, can we decide what whose responsibility it is to avoid that from happening again? It's a separate conversation. So, I understand, but yeah, I just don't so want to be wasting everything. I think time. that um, what I what I think I might hear people say is that someone would like to amend the motion to table <coughs> the follow the remaining policies that are listed here for removal. Um, so that committee can organize and get information out to the full board prior to asking you to make a decision. Well, I'd like to, to yes. if, table it if it's going to be effective and we have a mechanism in place to ensuring that the documentation is provided well, to the, the first public. Thing That's you have what to, I was trying to Yeah, the first thing you have to do is either vote on this or table it in order to... I thought we were in discussion. Right, but you're suggesting a whole separate discussion outside of the removal of this policy. And so you have to take action on that motion that's in front of you before you can propose another action. I'm, I move to table it. Second. All those in favor? Yes. I would, I would also like to make another suggestion, if that's okay. Um, I, I'd like for um, the, the board to perhaps endorse policy um, and a couple of people suggested it, um, kind of looking at some sort of a blanket statement. It doesn't have to be huge, some sort of a blanket statement that acknowledges <laughs> that we are um, going to have protocols that are going to be updated and we have a, we have a, a philosophical um, statement that addresses the concerns that I'm hearing tonight and that maybe that can be part of uh, our policy page that would reference all of the protocols. I also believe that the protocols need to be posted not just on the wellness 
part of the website, but also on the main policy page, maybe at under a list, under protocol or procedure or regulation, whatever you want to call it. I know um, when I was researching the um, Department of Ed's um, stipulations on um, the allergy policy, they, they stipulate three or four different ways that we have to communicate the procedure to the public. And one of those, one, it talks about how is the governing body going to communicate what those procedures are. And one of the places they said it could be is, is where we post all of our other policies, even though this wouldn't necessarily be a policy. But still, the, the information being out there in public and accessible to the community in a place where all of our other board business is accessible, for me, is important. Well, well I'd, I'd like to add to the policy agenda that we just implement that one or two line or get that done. And then when we're here next time, I think that we'll be in better shape to act on all policies. So yeah, I'm just Claire, I need clarification on the <coughs> protocols because I know that we are speaking for our nursing staff we would not be in favor of posting these now on the health services um, link Correct. because they haven't been, you have ones in here. Mm -hmm. So where well, would you like them to be posted for the public? Maybe we can get back to you on that. Well, I don't, I don't think we can post them we'll post until them. we remove the policies or to figure out what we're going to do with an umbrella policy. We can list policy. them under meeting materials. Correct. So similar to like we did with um, the calendar tonight. We oh, can right, simply yeah. post the draft, you know, the draft protocol, so that way the public has access to them. Okay. Um, that's an easy fix. I just want to make clarification on the motion. The amended motion is that to rem is that to table all of the policies listed, or just JLC E it's just JLC. dash R. I, 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 if it wasn't clear, I'd amend it to include all of the all of policies because they, it, everybody needs all that documentation, including yeah. the policies. Okay. So I was speaking of all because yeah. I don't think we're going to make progress mm -hmm. with the rest of them either. So you just need a second for that? And then we, did, we, we did. We did. We did. For the uh, amendment? Uh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, I, would, I would like to not bring this forward at our next meeting. I think you know, we've heard tonight there's a lot of emotion around this. Mm -hmm. It has been a roller coaster for the parents who have been concerned with the allergy piece. And it is not fair. Um, I do believe that our policy is so far out of date. Um, even in just reading it, it, it addresses a very specific allergy. It doesn't address all allergies. There is a ton of work to modify that if we're going to retain it. Um, so I think it's really a conversation again to go back to policy of if we're going to keep this, we're going to need to invest a lot of time in making these changes. I'm happy to do that. Um, but that puts a lot of other work <coughs> aside, and it, does, it already is against the policy goals that we put forward. That's not to make light of any of this, but if our goal was to streamline and ensure that we were addressing so many policies that haven't been or out of alignment, um, but we'll take this back. Um, Thank you to the folks who did send emails um, and who spoke tonight. I know that this is an emotional topic. Um, it's personally emotional for me as well. I have allergies myself and totally understand the concern and the fear that people have. I would like to thank the policy committee for the work. I, I don't at all mean to diminish. I know how many hours you guys have spent and how many meetings you have had. I just can't, in good conscience, vote when I don't have the materials I need to make an, the most informed decision. And so, for me, this isn't even necessarily about making a request of policy to go back um, <coughs> at this time, but what I would ask is that um, we establish um, a way to make sure that all of the support materials are provided to the public and to the board prior to especially a vote. And I think the, the cleanest way to do that is each committee chair, no matter what committee you chair, if you have materials that you want to be published with the agenda, you just need to make sure that that gets to Kelly J the Friday before this, the school board meeting so that she can get it all scanned and put together and linked to the agenda that, or to the website. Mm -hmm. The one thing that um, I think policy needs to consider about that request is you know, when you're taking action on an item, 
um, say for example a contract or something like that it's not necessarily public information before you have viewed it so you do have privy to material prior to the public in some context and so we just want to make sure that we're clear about where those boundaries are and that's something that policy can certainly flesh out mm -hmm. um, and it's a great topic to bring up at your retreat that you're having mm -hmm. on March 9th with Ann Chapman because she really is a policy mm -hmm. expert um, so these are really good questions to bring up there and get really clear about your own protocols and norms when it comes to policy development. Julie, when will the um, the resource that I know Kelly's been working really hard on, when will we be able to start piloting that live? Our hope is that um, we'll have it ready for the next school board meeting. Perfect. This, this just for the public, this is a, we talked about it briefly I think at the last meeting, but this is a, uh, a resource where you'll be able to see what policies we're working on, what, what's on deck, what's in draft form, what's ready to be voted on, so you can go in and real live time see the work that we're doing in policy and I'm hoping that will help with the communication in terms of our policy work moving forward. It's going to be a really great resource for you. I'm really excited about it. I wanted to thank Kelly publicly for all the work you've done on that because I know, I mean, it is a lot of work. And it, it looks really cool. It's going to be a wonderful resource for the community. Leanne, I just want to say, I, I'm not, sorry, this is going back, but I, I'm not really in favor. I, I, I'm not, I didn't table this so that policy could go back and, and, and change what the procedure document is because I don't want nurses to think that we don't trust the protocols that they have put in place here or the draft protocols that they have put in place. And, and, and like you, this is not just like a nebulous issue to me that I'm trying to understand. I have a life-threatening allergy. My child has a nut allergy. And, and I don't really have a problem removing those because I, I understand what, you're, what the nurses are saying. I trust them. I trust that these are being these protocols are being looked at on a regular basis. I know that children have individualized health mm -hmm. plans. Um, <coughs> but I, yeah, yeah. I just, I just, the charge as you want them to go back and develop an I'm umbrella not, policy exactly, first. Exactly, I'm not, yes. I don't want you to go back and try to review this. I under, because it isn't, it isn't fair to the nurses to say, every time you want to make a change to these protocols, you have to go through the board. It's, it, it will it, it's be, far too um, cumbersome. Exactly. So, but, but what I am saying is, instead of like rewriting our policy, I just would like an insurance that these protocols and procedures that the nurses are doing are Thank you for being, clarification. Are being what? Are being um, reviewed. Appreciate that. Well, like I said, whenever a student mind. comes in with a with a con, with a <coughs> allergy that we, if they followed the policy, children with only n nut allergies would have been addressed. I agree. I I have a problem with the protocols the way they are. Yeah. The procedure so because it only addresses nut all, allergies. That's how these came about. Is that as ever, kids came in over the years with more right. different allergies, they had to address and and develop how they were going to take care of that. So this was probably better for kids in what we were doing than the policy that you had. Thank you. And you can thank the nurses. For I will thank the nurses because they have worked really very hard um, on these things. I see a lot of late nights with us um, yes. going through this. So yeah, and I much appreciated. And they've met quite a bit to do this. All right. Um, in essence of time, I'm going to try to hustle through with. 10-5 appointments, 10-5-1 middle school winter two coaches. The recommendation is to approve the middle school winter two coaches as printed. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous across <laughs> the board. 10-5-2 um, high school co-curricular. The recommendation is to approve Mary Beth Nolt as the high school school newspaper advisor to be funded through the general fund as printed. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Seven and two. Um, 10.6, let's see, we can do this in five minutes. Oh, you're not gonna be able to do it. Oh, well, <laughs> the 2019-2020 school, school district calendar. 
So I'll give a brief introduction and then uh, Joanne, as you're gathering your notes, you can feel free to add in. So this is our annual school calendar that you are required to approve each year. It highlights when school holidays are, when late starts will be, um, when professional days will be, and when school board meetings will be. This is a calendar that is developed collaboratively with five other school districts in our region. Um, we are all school districts who send students to the Westbrook Regional Vocational Technical School um, and that, that we also have Westbrook as our fiscal agent, which is our commonality because we do send students to paths as well, but we are required to have a common calendar with those five other schools, which means that we can't have any more than five dissimilar days in a school year. Um, this is a challenge for us each year because each school district has already from the gate different number of student days. So some districts have 175, which is the minimum requirement. Some have 176. We have 177. Um, so right away we're dissimilar by a number of days. Um, and then we all have different sort of starting dates and starting expectations. Julie, do you want to throw it up on the line? I think there's a slide, isn't there? So Joanne, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that you said it. That's exactly it. Thank you. So the recommendation is to approve the 1920 school calendar as printed. So moved. Second. Okay. Open for discussion. Oh, I have a bunch of questions about this. this is, I'm going to have the same question I had last year, which is, um, is there so I have a concern about having one day of school for the K-2 students before a four-day weekend. Um, because if you've ever had a K-2 student and you gear them up to go to school, it takes quite a process and they go to one day and then they have a four-day weekend and then Tuesday comes around and they're like, what do you mean I have to go back to school? So my question is, ha have you talked to the K-2 teachers about any of if they have those same concerns as the concerns I hear from parents about having one day of school and whether that's worthwhile and why we do it that way. So we do talk to K2 teachers. What happens on the 27th and 28th are individual student appointments. Yep. So students come into school and they meet their teacher. Um, and then the 29th is really like an orientation day. Much like on the 27th, grades three, six, and nine have the school all to themselves to have that orientation day. Mm -hmm. um, and so the challenge that we have is with so many limited professional development days in our calendar, um, the, uh, the other alternative would be bringing students in and then teachers trying to get coverage or pull students out of class in order to do those baseline assessments for the incoming K-2 students. Um, and so it's just a matter of what's the most efficient, effective way. And you know, I think we believe as a school system that it's better for students to be with their teachers for one whole day than have them not be with their teacher for three to five days because it would take much longer to do that assessment. So, and then I guess in conjunction with that, what's the rationale for having that Friday off? Why don't we just have school that day? Why is Labor Day a four day weekend? Again, it has to do with the common calendar. I don't know that there's any schools in Maine that go to school on that Friday. Do you okay. know of any? There might be one or two, but it's, I mean. Certainly not in our region. No, I'm not, yeah. not right, not in New York and Cumberland County, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, and similar to that, I also have an issue with the Friday before April vacation. Why that's, do we have that off? That's a comp day for teachers because of, um, that's in, uh, for, for doing parent-teacher conferences at night. They actually have two comp days, yes. so they get the day right before Thanksgiving yeah. and, um, and that day before the, the April break. Okay. That's a collective bargaining obligation. It's also common but with it doesn't have to be the that majority day, of York and Cumberland County. It doesn't have to be that day, but again, with the five dissimilar days, that's when the majority of York and Cumberland County, to repeat what Amy's saying, <laughs> have off. We need to be just cognizant of the time. What's what that? was it? We need to be cognizant of the time. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna. Do we do extending? Yeah. Motion to extend. Um, oh, I, we'd have to table this. Is there a motion to table the school calendar? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Motion to extend um, the conversation <coughs> to complete the school calendar. Reluctantly, so moved. Second. <laughs> what time? I'm not putting a time on it because we're going to hope that it 
We're almost there. I feel it. Fine, 10 15. Okay. <laughs> Any discussion? No. So, all those in favor? Unanimously so moved. And now a motion to take from the table the school calendar for 2019 2020. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Awesome. All right. Thank you. Discussion can continue. Thank you. <laughs> I lost my chance. I'm sorry. <laughs> so so you were last you asking. You could have just it. I we were asking you guys saying. making me uncomfortable. It was I think 9.59 and 30 seconds over here. Well, if I could point out a couple other things that might make you love the calendar a little bit more. Um, one of the things that we... <laughs> One of the things that we really tried to do with the calendar this year was make Late Start Wednesdays more consistent. So you'll notice that they are on the second Wednesday of every month. The only exception is June 3rd. And that's just um, so that we're not having a late start on what could potentially, if the weather cooperates, be the last day of school. Um, and then school board meetings, of course, follow the same pattern as currently because of your policy that states the first and third Thursday of the month. That make it more appealing. <laughs> the last thing I'll point out is that we have 177 <coughs> student days and 182 staff days, and so, um, so that also is factors into the common calendar part. And we are so I, just to be clear, we're approving this calendar and the number of days, but not necessarily the times. There are no times. There are no times. This is just here. the calendar and the number of days. Yes. So what, why do we have 177 days when the other schools in the in the consortium? Have it's what it? what they decide to pay for their teachers, and because it goes along, along with the contract too. Because uh, some schools have 177, some have 175, one has 178. It depends. And my understanding is that a number of years ago, the goal was to increase the amount of instructional time, time. and that's why we added additional student days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, you're negotiating a contract right now, so if, if the, through the negotiations you added more, say, professional development days, this would have to be amended. But we have to vote based on what the current contract is and what the current reality is. Well, we have to be, after you vote on this, I will be sending it over to Westbrook, who sends all five calendars up to the state um, for approval. You think they'll say we should start after Labor Day? No. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Just wondering. You want to get out of school July 1st? Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> what, there was a year we started after Labor Day, I know it. Yeah, and I think and we got out. it was the year that my child went to school. I think we got out June 25th or 23rd that year. We couldn't, yeah, it was very late. Okay. Okay. Well, um, to make you feel even better about this calendar, <laughs> when I was in New Jersey, we started after Labor Day and the kids had 180 days, and we often went to June 25th, 26th if there was a snow day. Yeah, so when I taught in Massachusetts, cool. I got married the 28th and I taught the 27th and then drove home because Ooh. we had. Like two, you know, we had two extra snow days or whatever. It was very late. Wow. Was not, we do and they went 180. All right, that's I think awesome too money. <laughs> <laughs> oh. okay, well, well, so the 17th still bothers me. Like that it's Friday before late. April vacation. It's a week off. Why do we need one, one random extra day? Family time. Mm -hmm. Gotta get that family there time. There is in. plenty of family time after one week off with three kids. Believe me. Are we ready to vote? Yes. I think we are ready to vote. Hillary, is there anything else on that very long list? Or are we good? Are you sure? Uh -huh. The floor is yours. Okay. All right. Are we ready to vote? Go home. Yes. All those in favor of accepting <coughs> the calendar as written? <laughs> it's yeah. It's a heavy eye roll. <laughs> Put that down. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. So yes. moved. <laughs> All those in favor? Second, third. Fourth. Yes. Oh, Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Apologies to our dedicated students.